Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Freedom. It was the only word that described the feeling. I stood outside the double doors of the courthouse and smiled up at the sky. It was a dreary gray, but for me, it felt like a bright blue. I breathed deeply, symbolically sucking in the court-ordered end of my private nightmare. My life was mine again. It would no longer involve lawyers, judges, and hatred. For four years, battle after battle, my ex dragged me through a divorce war. We had originally parted ways with the idea of splitting everything down the middle because her salary was comparable to mine. It was her lawyer who found the arrangement unacceptable. My lawyer convinced me to go thermonuclear over it. In the end, I ended up with a quarter, she with another quarter. It was the lawyers who ended up with half. Financially, it would have been better to give in at the beginning. There was a time when hate was not a word I used. Now, I hated Linda Barrow. I would have shouted it from the rooftops if it would have ended the legal roller coaster. In my mind, I renamed her Witch Barrow. I could only imagine what she called me. The four years took a large toll from my soul. I was thankful there were no children. We had come close once. A miscarriage I thought a curse at the time. Now, a blessing. To drag a child through it all would have created monstrous therapist bills and pain that would never go away. Nine years of marriage, four of it fighting a divorce, gone to waste. It was difficult to remember how we once felt when we thought we would conquer the world together. I had been replaced with we and now back to I. Women were off my list, at least for the foreseeable future. I dated once during the separation and it turned out badly. I had thought she knew I was in the middle of divorce. She had thought me unmarried and more than mind. Hate was the word she used. It struck deep and scared me off the dating scene. It was an easy thing to forego. I sucked at dating. As I neared my car, my phone vibrated in my pocket. It was Carl, a good friend. One of my true compatriots who suffered with me these last four years. He hated Witch Barrow almost as much as I. Intellectually, I knew it was more of dislike on his part, but he spoke hate for my benefit and I loved him for it. Are you barrelless? Carl asked when I said hello. Completely and legally, I answered with a swagger in my voice. I had not felt this happy in years. It was almost worth the four years of hell. Strip club. Meat market, sports bar, you pick, and I'll drink the memories away with you, Carl offered. He sounded as happy as I. There was nothing I wanted more that moment. Sports. I need a friend and alcohol. It will be a few months before I can look at a woman without frowning. Of course, I was exaggerating, but I truly needed a testosterone night. There was a hockey game tonight, a few craft beers, and some zealous cross-checking fit my mood. I wanted to forget the last four years. Forget which barrow. Sounds good, we'll catch the blues game, Carl agreed. I'll leave work early and meet you at McGinney's at 5. We'll eat crap, try a new brew and screw the past. I loved how he put things when he was in the mood to let go. I had a few fair weather friends, but Carl was my anchor when the shit hit the fan. There was no problem that a night out with him wouldn't ease. 5 it is. The line went dead as I knew it would. Goodbyes were just not his thing. I drove home and grabbed some jeans and a gray pullover sweater to replace my suit. My man, Damon. Carl yelled from across the bar. He was in jeans with a blues hockey jersey. The numbers were fading, it being a long time, often worn favorite of his. I could tell he left work really early because he had a half-empty glass in front of him and another completely empty one next to it. I smiled at his demeanor and waved my fist in the air. Carl was exactly what I needed tonight. I reached the table just as a waitress, somewhat cute and way too young, brought two tall glasses of a dark beer. I guess the empty glass was, at one time, originally for me. Carl shook off my wallet. The night is on me, he said. Ripping a 20 out of a thick money clip. Come on, Carl, I said, trying to feign insult. I have no intention of drinking all night on your dollar. Round for round then, Carl answered. I'll get the first. He handed the waitress the money before I could disagree. It was going to be good night. Carl was not the person you would want to see at a funeral or any other solemn affair. He was too loud and insisted everyone knew he was there. When I wanted to party, he was my go-to guy. He was too big for anyone to voice disapproval of and too nice to dislike. Above all, he was boisterous. Hockey was a good sport for him. All the fans were loud. After a few beers, I was loud with him. The tables next to us became loud as well. They all became Carl tables. I met Edith and Ralph Wilkerson, Frank and Bob, and two rather butch-looking older women named Mary and Thelma. We became a small party zone and our cheerleader, Carl, kept us going as if we were on the ice itself. Bad calls were his favorite, unless it was against the opposing team. I found myself, 
as I fully expected, joining in his complaints and high-fiving around the party zone when we scored. Carl only spilled one beer that night. A miracle if there ever was one. The man could not speak without waving his arms around. Tall beer glasses were just asking to get dumped. I was wearing some of the beer on my leg. It was pretty wet, but not so much I wanted to leave. We stayed well after the game ended. How does it feel to be single again? Carl asked as ESPN took over the screens, showing some soccer game from the other side of the planet. Like a huge weight has been lifted, I said taking a long draw of some wheat beer. I lost count of how many we had had. I had no idea what the name of the brew in my glass was anymore. It was sweet after all the dark beer we had chewed our way through. It didn't matter. I would finish it anyway. That's why I never married, Carl said, tapping his glass against mine. I wasn't going to point out the obvious to him. He has been living with a woman, Deborah, for over six years. They were married in all but the legal sense. She let him have a night out every week, knowing he wouldn't stray much past stuffing a few dollars in a stripper's g-string. I took another sip of my beer, wondering how you find such a tolerant woman. Linda was never tolerant, that was for sure. I shook my head to remove Linda from my brain. I was supposed to be forgetting her. You sure you don't want to run to the east side and throw some dollars away? Carl asked. I could see it in his eyes. He wanted an excuse to go stuff some G-strings. Next time, I answered. Linda had sucked that desire out of me. I felt guilty not repaying his favor of celebrating my divorce. I just wouldn't appreciate it tonight. I just want to sit here and forget the last four years. I waved the waitress over. The beer in my glass only had a few minutes left. What's the next one on the list? I asked the waitress. You guys went through all ten, she answered. Unless you want to start on the lights. I looked at Carl and his eyebrows raised. We don't drink piss, we said in unison. We laughed. An old joke between us that was lost on our waitress and anyone else in the world who wasn't us. I knew we had had too much to drink. So we did the only thing we could do. We'll just start at the top again, I said and Carl smiled and tipped his empty glass to me. The waitress rolled her eyes and headed off to get us another pair of brown dead eyes. I was feeling no pain. I don't want to hate her anymore. I slurred slightly to Carl when we were halfway through the list the second time. My mind was functioning slowly, but my emotions seemed real enough. It's over, Carl agreed. Let her go. You shouldn't hate anyone. I think that was Carl's whole philosophy on life. Don't hate anyone. But I still don't like her. Nah. She dragged you through the mud, Carl agreed. Just don't hate her. It's not her fault she's a witch. I lost it there. A fit of laughing took over and Carl joined in. I tried to stop when it struck me that Linda probably had a friend telling her it wasn't her fault because I was an a-hole. That brought on a private bout of laughing. I had definitely had too much to drink. It was Carl who made my stupor happy instead of sullen. It was sad, really. Linda and I had loved each other once. There was no reason, but human idiocy to move to hate, some strange desire to find fault not our own, and in time, making it our own. No, I would not hate Linda, the witch barrow. I would move to indifference. It was over and hate would only hurt me more than her now. Carl, I said with drunken truth, I love you buddy. We clinked glasses and for some reason they didn't break. We definitely hit them hard enough. I drained my glass and ordered water. It was time for a little detox. I thought carefully about getting into my car. I had stopped drinking almost an hour ago and was fully hydrated. I walked a straight line when no one was looking and didn't stumble. I probably shouldn't have gotten behind the wheel, but I didn't feel impaired. I had no trouble selecting the unlock button by feel on the key fob. Having to struggle to unlock the car was usually the sign that indicated my mind was off. I started the car, pulled out my phone and synced with the onboard. I rolled through a bunch of songs until I found Jewel. Sometimes you just need a sweet voice to soothe you. Her voice always left me craving more, like a book you wished wouldn't end. She filled my car with sweetness as AI backed out of the parking slot and entered traffic. Carl had fixed me again. My heart was lighter, and, with the end of the divorce, I felt excited about the future. I turned down Travis Street, going west, and passed my next turn. I had a desire to just drive and let the music fill me. I wrapped myself in the private little world of my car, my mouth moving in sync with the words of you were meant for me. So much for testosterone. I smiled at the irony. I missed the green at Garnet Road, a rather long light. I stopped and closed my eyes for a moment to fully enjoy the song. Jewel ended and the randomizer screwed up and started Magic Carpet Ride. Not what I desired at the moment. I needed a mood phone, one that could sense that Steppenwolf was not what I needed. I looked down at my phone to readjust the selection list. I was thrown forward, hard. 
The sound of crushing metal vibrated through me as my seat belt cut hard into my chest. My forehead clipped the steering wheel before I realized what happened. My car was now half into the intersection and a dark SUV, its left headlight and grille caved in, was sitting on my rear end. My head hurt and Steppenwolf was still blaring. Shit. I turned off the engine and engaged the hazard lights. I stumbled out of the car. My head was swimming through molasses. The light was green. That from the voice A of woman. I blinked long to get my bearing. She hit me, I thought. Your tail lights were out, she added. There was nothing wrong with my tail lights. I walked to the back of the car and both were a shattered mess. The SUV had come up over the top of my bumper and caved in the trunk. The vehicles were conjoined, and the left wheel of the SUV was an inch or so off the pavement. There was nothing wrong with my lights, I said, trying to remain calm. The tail lights were both out now, smashed beyond recognition. Only the left rear blinker seemed to be working. They were out, and the light was green, the lady insisted. I looked up into her scrunched up eyebrows. Her nostrils were flared, and her lips were curved down. I had seen the expression before. She must have taken witch barrel lessons. She moved her hands to her hips, daring me to disagree again. Look, it was an accident, I stated. You don't need to dump it all on me. That's what insurance is for. It was a neutral statement. For years of which city and a guy becomes wary of entering unnecessary wars. Her nose moved strangely, and I saw a sly smile form. You smell like a brewery, she said as if it was some kind of victory. It was the damn drink Carl spilled. I took a step back. I couldn't imagine it was that potent. It happened over an hour ago. Some beer spilled on my pants. I defended myself, pointing down my leg. We'll just call the cops and see how this plays out. She pulled her phone from her front pocket and began dialing. She stalled on the last number and looked up to me. The light was green and your tail lights were out. I sighed. Fine, I said, not confident I could pass a breathalyzer test. That's what insurance was for anyway. She canceled the call. Boxers or briefs? She asked me. I looked at her and tried to decipher what type of insanity had claimed her. Maybe I just attracted women who like to torture men. What? Do you wear boxers or briefs? She repeated, enunciating every word as if I didn't speak English. Her short blonde hair jerked back and forth with every word, as if she needed more emphasis. Are you nuts? I asked. Her car was mounting mine. The damage would be in the thousands. She had successfully blackmailed me into taking the blame, and now she wanted to survey my underwear. I was the one who had been drinking, so why did she sound stoned? Suit yourself, she said as she rolled her eyes at me. God, I hated when Linda rolled her eyes at me. It felt worse from this woman, and I didn't even know her. She began to move back to her SUV. Why the hell do you care about my choice of underwear? I called out, my hand waving in disgust. She turned to me with her hand on the driver's side door. The cops are coming whether I call them or not, she stated with boredom. Using an insulting you are an idiot tone, if they're boxers, you can toss your jeans in my car. We keep this as a simple accident that way. She opened the door, reached in and pulled out a small black purse. I heard sirens in the background. She had done this before. Are you setting me up? I asked. Maybe some kind of insurance scam. Moore rolled eyes as she pulled her license from her purse. Look, she stalled, letting her arms drop to her sides. If this is my fault, I'll lose my license for six months or worse, and my insurance will likely drop me. If it's yours, I live to drive another day. She shrugged her shoulders. Accidents were not new to her. The sirens were getting closer. They are going to smell what I smelled, she added shaking her head like she was trying to get a two-year-old to figure it out for himself. I emptied my pockets onto the hood of my car and removed my jeans. Embarrassingly, I was wearing Ghostbusters boxers. They had been a gag gift, from Linda, some time ago. I had no idea why I still had them, but I had a strange affinity to the movie. I hadn't planned on stripping in the street. Nice. The woman smiled. I would have preferred the eye roll. I handed her my jeans which she promptly threw over the seat into the back of her SUV. You were on your way out for late night tacos, she said as if an alibi was second nature to her. You threw on a sweater and headed for the drive through I nodded. Damon. Damon Richardson. I introduced myself. Ghostbusters fan. I got a chuckle out of her at least. It was better than the eye roll. Rebecca Morrison, she responded. And the movie wasn't that good. She obviously had bad taste in movies. I could see flashing lights so I grabbed my wallet and keys off the hood and threw my phone in the front seat. Do you always blackmail your victims, Rebecca? I asked, trying to maintain some humor in my voice. It was easy. I was in the middle of Dark Street wearing Ghostbusters underwear.
Thank God they didn't glow in the dark. Sorry, I have no choice. You don't look like you have a string of priors to worry about. Priors? I was hoping she was talking about accidents. She was awfully cool about handling the situation. She retrieved a mint from her purse and handed it to me. I popped it in my mouth. She seemed prepared for every contingency. I was wondering why I didn't hate her. I should. She was screwing up my night fairly well. The police car pulled up behind us, light spinning, illuminating my underwear. Our cars were blocking the lane and protruding into the intersection. Someone had called since we were an obvious hazard. Anyone hurt? The officer asked loudly from behind his door, one foot still in the car. We both shook our heads and said no. I'll be with you in a moment, he stated and ducked into his car and shut the door. You'll need your registration, Rebecca said as she leaned into the cab of her SUV. Her jeans were awfully tight, and she wore them well. I admired the view for a moment before the idiocy of it struck me. I was admiring the rear of a woman who was dumping her crap on me. I shook off the image and moved to retrieve my vehicle registration. The officer was making us wait. I assumed he was clearing Rebecca's license plate since mine was buried under the SUV. I leaned against the trunk of my poor car and waited. So, you drink a lot on weekdays? Rebecca asked as she moved closer to me. I assumed she felt as exposed as I did in the rolling police lights. I wasn't sure if I wished to share my life with her. I didn't peg her as a nice person, but I was a little exhausted with disliking people. It was a celebration of sorts, I answered. I usually don't drink much at all. I gave her too much information. Birthday? Rebecca continued with a soft smile. It was the smile that pissed me off. It was fairly attractive and disarming. The defenses I had been practicing for four years kicked in. Nice was just her cover. Look, I replied with more strictness than needed. We're not going to be friends. You're screwing me over pretty well. Just be happy I'm not fighting it. Her face looked like I had just slapped it. Her eyes shifted quickly away from mine. She hesitantly took a step back, then turned and walked quickly back to her vehicle. She leaned against it, facing away from me. I convinced myself Rebecca did it to herself. Then I convinced myself I was an a-hole. Then I remembered she rear-ended me and blackmailed me into taking the blame. Then again, I probably should have called a cab from the bar. She did hide my jeans for me, but she lied about the tail lights. I had no idea if the light was green. I was looking at my phone. I settled on the smile. No woman would smile like that unless she was trying to pull one over on me. I assigned her 90% culpability, and I accepted 10% as an a-hole. At least she would know I wasn't a complete sucker. The officer climbed out of his squad car and donned a Stetson. He titled it forward then adjusted it slightly left and right. I sensed he was rather full of himself. He came forward toward Rebecca so I began to approach. Stay with your vehicle, sir. The officer commanded with his hand raised. I will speak with her first. I didn't like the idea of Rebecca talking without me. The story would get garbled between us. That, and I had kind of told her to screw off. I wondered if a sobriety test was in my future. The officer and Rebecca had what I considered a rather long conversation. I couldn't hear any of it but I did see her gesturing to me in my car then pointing down the street. She nodded a few times and shook her head in response to some questions. I saw what looked like pleading, then resignation said it. She turned away from the officer and put her hands behind her back. She looked over to me and mouthed, I'm sorry, as cuffs found her wrists. I had never seen someone I knew get arrested before. I started moving forward, but was held back by the officer again. Stay with your vehicle, sir. I will be with you in a moment. He led Rebecca back to his car and placed her safely into the back seat. I figured I was next. She must have mentioned the beer. Why else would she be sorry? But, why would he arrest her? I stood in the road, like an idiot, in my Ghostbusters boxers. Mr. Richardson? The officer queried as he approached me, reading my name off his notebook. Yes. I am going to need to see your license, registration, and proof of insurance, the officer stated. He pulled a metal clipboard in front of him accepted my documents and placed them under the clip. I should be able to give you a report in 15 minutes and get you on your way. There are tow trucks on the way. He walked to the front of my vehicle to get my license plate number. Why did you arrest Ms. Morrison? She's operating on a restricted license, the officer said, never looking up from his clipboard, to and from work only. He moved forward with a flashlight to read my VIN number through the windshield. She will be charged with reckless driving for this accident. That and violating her court restrictions puts her in the felony category. He looked up at me, sit tight for a few moments while I run your information, and I'll get you a copy of my accident report for your insurance company. You don't want my side of the accident? It won't be necessary, the officer responded. 
Ms. Morrison has taken full responsibility for it. Texting while driving causes more of these than you know. He shrugged his shoulders and headed back to his vehicle. He stopped halfway and turned, I would like to know what you're doing in your underwear. Ah, I had a taste for tacos. I fumbled. I was just going to go through the drive through Didn't figure I would get in an accident. No one ever does. He nodded with a half grin and continued on his way. I looked at the police car, but was unable to see Rebecca inside. I realized I had hurt her when I snapped at her questions. I was feeling guilty she was taking responsibility. Damn it. She was responsible. The smile was real though. I knew that now. She could have played the DUI card on me. She had the gall to apologize. 10% her fault, 90% pure a-hole for me. I should have just driven straight home. The tow trucks arrived, two large flatbeds with winches to pull the vehicles aboard. I watched as the two drivers separated the vehicles by bouncing themselves on my rear bumper. Somehow I had figured it would have been a more technical solution. I retrieved my phone from the car before Ralph, the driver to the truck that would take my car, pulled it onto the flatbed. When both vehicles were loaded, they did a quick sweep up of the street to collect the shattered remnants. The officer returned just as the tow truck drivers were finishing. Here is a copy of the initial report. Ms. Morrison's contact information, insurance, and contact information for the owner of the SUV. I have stapled my card on the top if there are any issues. She doesn't own the vehicle? No, the officer answered. I don't have the insurance details on the vehicle yet. He handed me my license, registration, and insurance card. What's going to happen to her? I asked, gesturing to his vehicle with my head. Ms. Morrison will be taken to county, the officer responded. She'll spend the night and probably post bail in the morning. I felt horrible. I knew I shouldn't, but I did. I misinterpreted the smile. I had to try to forget. It wasn't my fault she rear-ended me. Why did I feel so guilty about her going to jail? It was the Barrow effect. I had assumed she was a witch like my ex. Now, all I saw was desperation followed by surrender. I made her surrender. I would have felt better about myself if she would have remained a witch. Then, at least, I wouldn't blame myself for the accident I didn't cause. Ralph drove me and my car back to his garage business. It was a small shop with a large fenced-in yard containing a dozen wrecked vehicles, all in a line. Mine extended the line. I called my insurance company while he unloaded, and I arranged for a rental for the next day. Carl, red-eyed and sleepy, picked me up and drove me home. He found my state of dress very humorous and worth the trip out in the dead of night. I was sure the story would be repeated loudly for many years to come. It was nearly lunchtime. I had been in meetings all morning and could barely keep my focus, not that many meetings needed focus. Lately, most of our gatherings at work were to allow people to tout their current achievements and feign the need for input. This morning, I actually attended a meeting to schedule more meetings. Thus was my life at Bradford Insurance and Casualty. I was paid well to design and optimize databases, mostly query optimization, a topic that always thrilled at parties. The work had become easy over the years, almost non-thinking. I was good at it and found it like riding a bike. It was everyone else's ignorance of the subject that allowed me a nice bi-weekly income. There were only two things in my life that disturbed my comfortable tedium. One was driven by the witch, no cross that off, Linda Barrow. That was over now. The other was the accident of the previous night. It had my mind drifting during the meetings. I still was not sure how to measure my a-wholeness. I was unable to force myself to accept none of it was really my fault. Rebecca brought it on herself. Every time I thought about it being her fault, I'd see her smile. I thought it a con used by a smart woman, but it had warmth, not malice, in it. Her lips mouthing sorry at me. I had hurt her more than she had hurt my car. I returned to my cubicle and caved into my own self-wrought guiltiness. I found the number for the county lockup online and, after three aborted attempts, punched in the number. I wasn't sure what I expected, but I needed to know Rebecca was okay. Most likely, I would never see her again anyway. County Corrections, how may I help you? The voice was more pleasant than I expected. For some reason, I expected a depressed sounding voice, something akin to sticky misery. Hi, I said as I tried to collect my thoughts. I had never called a prison before. I am calling about Rebecca Morrison. I heard some keyboard work. How may I help you, sir? The kind voice asked again. I wasn't sure. Why did I call? I wanted to make sure Ms. Morrison had made bail, I replied. I guess that is what concerned me. I wanted to make sure everything was not as grim as it appeared last night. No, sir, the voice responded. Ms. Morrison is still here with us. Crap. Why did I call? It made me feel worse, not better as I had intended. I sighed and decided to sink deeper into the quagmire. May I speak with her? 
I can take a message to her, sir. The voice was practiced at these requests. She will have to return your call. I wasn't sure she would return my call. No, thank you, I replied and hung up. I took a deep breath and stared out my window. A phenomenal view of the parking lot greeted my eyes, though I didn't really see any of it. It took me seven years to wrangle a cubicle next to a window, and now I just took it for granted. It wasn't my fault, I told myself as I stood. This is really stupid, I said under my breath, to myself as I entered my car. I'm a stupid idiot, I reminded myself, out loud. As I pulled into the county lockup, I would like to post bail for Rebecca Morrison, I told the clerk at the gated window. The waiting room, if that is what it was, was filled with plastic chairs they must have sourced from the DMV. They were lined up in two rows, as if there would be a lot of people waiting. I was the sole person. The clerk pointed to a door off to the side and pushed a button under his counter. A buzzer sounded. The lock clicked and I opened the door without instruction. Cattle are trained in such ways. Like a bank, a row of teller positions, each with a next window sign, were lined up along a counter. Only one position was open, but no clerk was waiting. I walked up and waited. So much for the cordial phone conversation I had earlier. My opinion of the lockup lowered greatly. It was a few minutes before a small woman with gray hair sauntered up. May I help? The woman asked. My grandmother used to do up her hair like hers. All curly and shaped perfectly round. I suspected she spent a large portion of her government paycheck on maintaining it. I would like to post bail for Rebecca Morrison, I repeated for her benefit. The woman reached below the counter, without looking, and retrieved a form. She typed in a few things on a keyboard and nodded. Then I heard a laser printer behind her kick up. She handed me a pin and pushed the form to me. Fill in everything above this line. She pointed at a thick black line about three quarters down the page. She retrieved the paper from the printer and returned to me. It is 3000 cash, money order, or credit card. My heart took a little jump. I had been thinking a few hundred. I tried not to look shocked as the woman stared at me. I should have asked while I was on the phone. Of course, I responded as I retrieved my wallet from my back pocket. I handed her my credit card while trying to hold my hand steady. This was a truly stupid idea. There is a 5% non-refundable service charge on credit cards, she informed me. I noticed she took the card before she told me. I did quick math in my head. 15? No, $150, and I didn't even know if Rebecca would skip on the 3000 to boot. I was a complete fool. I filled out the form as the woman ran my card. My hand was shaking, and my left eye had a twitch that didn't seem to want to stop. Name, address, phone number in relation to the imprisoned. I was not sure what to put on the relation line. Friend, seemed inappropriate since I had clearly told her I wasn't. Certainly not family. Acquaintance, seemed the most likely. Then I smiled and wrote victim. Screw it. I had to sign at the bottom to attest that I understood the bond would be forfeited if Rebecca failed to show at any of her appointed court appearances. I was committed, so I signed. The lady returned, had me sign a charge receipt, stapled it, and the paper from the printer to my form. She took an official stamp, inked the bottom of the form, and signed it. She lifted the form and looked at the sheet from the printer. Please take a chair in the waiting room. She pointed to the door I had entered. Ms. Morrison will be with you shortly. She turned and walked to a small room where another clerk was busy with a pile of papers. That was the quickest 3000 I had ever spent. I returned to the waiting room and sat on one of the plastic chairs. It was 20 minutes before a buzzer sounded, and a door farther down the room opened. Rebecca exited slowly, her eyes red, her blonde hair disheveled. She had not slept well. I stood and began to worry about what I would say. I had no good answers for why I would stupidly help her. You paid my bail? She had stopped walking and stood about 10 feet away from me. I could see concern in her eyes. Maybe she thought I expected something. It felt wrong, I answered poorly. I don't know why, but I didn't want you to spend the day in there. Her head tilted slightly as she considered what I said. You will go to court, right? I added, my $3,000 still weighed heavily on my mind. I think it was the wrong thing to ask. I saw her eyes water and I began to rethink what I couldn't unsay. Rebecca moved toward me, her bottom lip trembling. She entered my personal space with no reservations and hugged me. Thank you for not hating me, she said. Then the floodgates opened. I could do nothing but hold her. I hadn't been anyone's shoulder in a very long time. I was out of practice. Nothing I could think of to say seemed appropriate. She was a blank slate to me, and prison didn't seem to be the only thing she cried about. Something deeper was wrong. I should not have come. She needed her own Carl. Can I give you a lift home? I asked softly. The closeness was uncomfortable, and I needed to get back to work. 
Rebecca wiped her eyes and broke her embrace. The absence of her arms around me was strangely disconcerting. Maybe I shouldn't have spoken quite so soon. I am sorry for last night, Rebecca admitted. Her remorse showed in her hazel eyes. I was desperate in thought. I don't know what I was thinking. I am not normally a witch. She gave me half a smile. It was a weak, non-confident smile that wrapped her apology. I wasn't at my best either, I said. My last words to you were, misguided. I was doing it, apologizing to the woman who rear-ended me. I had no spine. Maybe Linda had ripped it out of me when I wasn't looking. I have to get back to work. Can I drop you somewhere? I asked again. I'm not sure, Rebecca said. Maybe my sister's. The maybe was disturbing. She must have seen the confusion in my face. I was staying with a friend. Her expression looked shy, and her cheeks reddened. That was her SUV last night. She isn't answering my calls. Homeless? I was in deeper shit than I had envisioned. Your sister's then, I said with a false smile, gesturing toward the door. The quicker I could drop her off, the better I would feel. I already did the white knight thing and had repaired my soul. It was time to exercise my spine. Rebecca smiled and led the way to the door, which I opened for her. I tried not to notice how well she filled in her jeans. I needed more backbone. Rebecca pulled out her phone and fiddled with it as we walked. Phone's dead. She informed me, couldn't charge it last night. I smiled, anxious to get her on her way, and pulled out mine and entered my code. Thank you, she said as I handed it to her. She laughed as she tried typing in the number a few times. I don't know the last time I had to remember her number. Hard to live without your contact list. I agreed. I reached the car and unlocked the doors, opening the passenger side for Rebecca. She stalled before she entered, raising one hand up to me and the other holding the phone to her ear. I waited as she listened intently. Kathy, it's Becca. I need to stay with you for a few days. Call me as soon as you get this, Rebecca stated and hung up. She's not answering right now, she said, looking a little distraught. The feeling was mutual. Rebecca tried to hand me my phone and clipped the side of the car door with it. Her eyes went wide when it fell from her hand. It spun away from us and landed glass down on the pavement. The sound of it hitting was not pleasant. Oh no. Rebecca cried as she squatted to pick it up. I closed my eyes, knowing what the ugly sound meant. Oh no, Rebecca said again as she turned the phone over in her hand. I am so sorry. Her voice sounded choked. I opened my eyes. The glass on my new phone had a thick crack running from one corner, diagonally across the face, to the other. The upper corner had a small web of cracks to mark the original landing point. I didn't mean. She started. I know. I said way too loudly. Rebecca jerked at my tone. I know. I said more calmly. She presented the phone to me, her hand shaking. I took a deep breath and took it from her. I pushed the button and a psychedelic array of colors appeared. The screen was unreadable. I should just wait here, Rebecca said, and began to back away. I'll call my sister from inside, she said, pointing at the door we had exited from. I could see tears forming in her eyes. I felt like shit, and my phone was broken. I knew then that she was a curse. It was my own fault for thinking I owed her something this morning. No. I said quietly. I put the paperweight of a phone in my pocket. I'm not leaving you here. It was only a phone, and not the first one I have broken. I stepped to the side and gestured for Rebecca to get in. She didn't move. She looked at me with tears running down her cheeks. I know you didn't mean it. It's only a phone, I said calmly. It happens a lot, Rebecca cried. She turned and moved back toward the building, her face in her hands. Shit. I ran to catch up with her. Rebecca, come on, don't stay here. The thought of leaving her here at the prison defeated the whole purpose of bailing her out. She turned to me, her cheeks flooded with smeared tears. I broke your car and your phone, and I don't even know if I can get your jeans back. Those were my best jeans. I shook the thought out of my mind. The jeans were old, I lied. The car and phone are insured. They were just accidents. I am a walking accident, Rebecca cried. For the second time in less than ten minutes, I let her cry on my shoulder. I held her as best I could in the middle of the parking lot. This time, I held her better. Look, I suggested stupidly. I have to get back to work. I'll drop you at my place. I still have a landline. You can call your sister and straighten everything out. I don't know why I trusted Rebecca. She just didn't seem like she was truly dishonest. Not the way she caved when she thought I was angry with her last night. She sniffled and broke her embrace. Mine was a slower release. I'm not sure that's a good idea, Rebecca replied. She wiped her eyes and looked at me. It would be better for you if you left me here. Nope, I said truthfully. 
I think I would be happier if I knew you were okay and not stuck in a prison waiting room. I was already in too deep to stop now. I have to protect my investment. I smiled to soften the message. I got a small smile back. It was better than the crying. At least I was a thoughtful idiot. Okay, but just until I get hold of my sister, Rebecca agreed. I smiled again and led her back to my car. I got her seated and closed the passenger door. I walked around the car calling myself a moron under my breath. I knew this wasn't the wisest course of action, but I kind of forced myself into it by showing up in the first place. Why did you bail me out? Rebecca asked carefully as I pulled out of the parking lot. That question had no good answer. Maybe she was as confused as I. Why did you tell the cop the truth last night? I responded with my own question. I didn't like myself after you yelled at me, Rebecca answered. Being arrested was better than having you hate me. Her honesty was surprising. I had thought she would dodge the question as I had. Why did they arrest you? The cops said you were on a restricted license, but usually they just give you a ticket or something. Rebecca looked down at her feet, and I instantly regretted asking. I was about to change the subject when she spoke. Things happen to me, Rebecca responded cryptically. I know they're my fault, like your phone. It's just not on purpose. It seems to happen a lot. She brushed imaginary dust off her jeans and absently picked at one of the leg seams. I really shouldn't drive. She looked up at me and there was sadness in her eyes. I am so sorry about last night. Not just the accident, but trying to dump the blame on you. She sounded completely sincere. So, there are a lot of accidents, I said stupidly. My attention returned to the road. For some reason I became more aware of my own driving. Is it okay if I don't tell you how many? Rebecca asked softly. I could feel the embarrassment in her voice. It didn't really matter how many, I was only involved with one. I shifted the subject. I was celebrating the end of my own mistake last night, I said, finally answering the question Rebecca had tried to ask last night. I looked over quickly and saw she was relieved I didn't press her about her history. A very long divorce, kind of bitter in the end. She was silent as I spoke, but her eyes were watching me. I wasn't ready for someone, especially a woman, to handle me the way you did last night. Sorry if I was a little heavy in the a-hole department. I was a witch. Rebecca's eyes went back to her jeans. I'm not a very good one. I fell apart when you told me I was. I never called you that. You were thinking it, and you were right. I looked over at her as she fiddled with jeans again. I bailed you out because I felt terrible for thinking you were a witch, I admitted. Her eyes came up to mine. I'm not very good at being an a-hole, I said as we shared a small smile. I moved my eyes back to the road. We were silent for a few minutes. My house burnt down, Rebecca said with no context. I have been living with friends, the last of which will probably never speak to me again. I looked over to her. She was looking right at me. I am not a good person to know. I wanted desperately to ask her about her house burning down. She was warning me, but it felt insulting to ask. I probably lost my job for not showing up to work today. The best thing that has happened to me in years is the guy I rear-ended bailed me out of jail. I was a little stunned at Rebecca's revelations. I wasn't sure how you respond to something like that. I thought Linda had driven my life into the dumpster, but I had been living the high life compared to Rebecca. At least I had Carl. Stupidly, I held my hand out to Rebecca. Hesitantly, she placed her hand in mine. I could use a friend as well, I said quietly. I felt her relax in her seat, her shoulders losing their stiffness. I wasn't as loud or friendly as Carl, but I could at least be present. Her hand felt good in mine. I was reluctant to remove it when I had to make a turn. I pulled into my driveway and prayed silently that my house wouldn't burn down. You have a nice home, Rebecca said as if it wasn't a good thing. She looked frightened. She was beginning to scare me. I shook it off. I wasn't going to fall into believing in luck, good or bad. She was basically a good person who had a string of bad things happen. It couldn't go on forever. My house was small, a bachelor pad in style. It was 30 years old and partially remodeled. It had an open kitchen, bordered by a counter with stools where I usually ate. Beyond the counter was a great room with a flat panel, a fireplace and a set of eclectic, comfortable furniture. There were two bedrooms, one basically an office now, and a single bathroom with a shower. Off the garage was a small mudroom that housed the smallest over and under washer dryer appliance I could find. Anything larger, and I wouldn't have been able to open the door to the garage. That is beautiful, Rebecca commented as she moved away from my pride and joy. Against the wall, opposite the flat screen, I had a large 210-gallon saltwater aquarium. It had taken me years to figure out how to deal with the salination and waste issues. Now, it was as perfect as it could get. I had given it a light blue rock bottom with natural and fake coral seemingly growing in odd directions. 
The fake coral created niches the smaller fish loved to hide in. It was bathed in soft light that gave the whole room a warm, bluish glow. Swimming slowly on the bottom, my lionfish sauntered along, its colorful dorsal waving slowly. The tank, and its care, is what kept me sane during the divorce. It was like a soothing movie that never stopped. My claim to fame, I said with a proud smile. That's Mufasa swimming along the bottom. Rebecca gave me a strange look. So I like cartoons, Sumi. Rebecca smiled. A very pleasing smile. I grabbed a pen and paper on the kitchen counter. I wrote down my office number, and thinking wisely, wrote down my home phone for her. Here's my office number, and this is the number here. I said as I pushed the paper toward her. I'm already late so feel free to look around. There should be something in the fridge and clean towels in the closet next to the bathroom. Help yourself, but please call or leave a note when you leave so I know you're okay. Rebecca smiled at me and sat on a stool and looked at my note. Thank you so much, Damon. I'm glad it was you I ran into last night. It was meant well, but sounded terrible. She lost her smile and looked at me with concern. You know what I meant. If I had to run into... I know. I laughed. The feeling is mutual. There was that wonderful smile again. I'm late. I reminded her as I hurried out. Thank you, Rebecca shouted again as I left. I was late to work, driving a rental. My phone was shot and my best pair of jeans were lost. I had known her for less than a day. Why didn't I hate her? More meetings. I barely made it to the first on time, and another had been added to my schedule during lunch. At least the second didn't have me staring at a useless PowerPoint presentation. I actually earned my keep during the last meeting. A large batch query some fool devised was taking too long to execute every night. I looked it over, devised an index, broke it into two queries, and brought it down to a 30-second job. Not bad for processing a couple hundred million rows. To me, it was a no-brainer. To the moron who coded the initial query, I was a lifesaver. His first attempt ran over three hours, essentially multiple full table scans with heavy temporary table creation. I accepted the praise and kept my secrets to myself. Sometimes I was a good at being an a-hole. I was back at my desk around three when the phone rang. Damon Richardson, I answered. Damon, it's Rebecca. I cringed and let out a breath. I didn't hear any sirens in the background, so maybe my place wasn't on fire. I can't reach my sister. I've tried a bunch of times, but she hasn't called me back. Do you think you can drive me to a hotel when you get back? My jaw released and I flexed it. The idea she was still at my house was not a bad one. In fact, it was kind of nice. Why don't you make dinner and spend the night? I offered in trade. I have two bedrooms. Dinner? Rebecca responded. She sounded less than excited about the idea. Sure. I continued. There are noodles in the cabinet above the dishwasher and some jars of spaghetti sauce next to them. I figured boiling water wasn't going to do any serious damage to the house. I shook the possible disasters out of my head. She'll do just fine. Are you sure? I've been here longer than I should already. I smiled to myself, maybe not long enough. I don't know about you, but I'm starving, I said with a light voice. I miss lunch, and it would be wonderful to have a hot meal waiting when I get home. I suddenly felt like I was talking to my ex. Back when we were still talking, my thoughts were a little cross-wired. Okay, I can do spaghetti, Rebecca replied, and I heard the smile in her voice. It brought one to my lips. What time will you be home? Now she sounded like a wife. About 5.30. I'll see you then, Rebecca said cheerfully. I was about to hang up when I heard her voice again. Damon, do you have an old t-shirt I can wear? I'd like to take a shower and wash my clothes. Bottom left-hand drawer of the dresser in my bedroom. Thanks. Why was I so happy she would be home when I got there? So far, knowing her had been a disaster. It has been about three hours since she had broken something of mine. Maybe the trend was over. One could always hope. I left work a little early and dropped my broken phone at the store. They said they could flip the SIM card and have a new phone fired up in about 20 minutes. 20 minutes in a phone store feels like a week. I told them I would be back in the morning. At the price I pay for the warranty, you would think they would have a phone fired up and waiting just in case. When I entered the house, my nose was greeted with a heavenly scent. It was spaghetti, but not like it comes out of the jar. This smelled like it had flavor. Rebecca was smiling when I entered the kitchen. She looked simply wonderful in my Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man t-shirt. I had to laugh as she modeled it with a little twirl. It was a little short, but covered all the basics. I found your spice rack, Rebecca said proudly. I gave the sauce a little kick. Smells wonderful, nothing seemed to be broken, and there were no flames. Not that I really expected damage, it was just nice that there wasn't any. Is that bread I smell? Yep, hillbilly bread, Rebecca said, then peeked into the oven. 
It was obviously not done yet since she closed the door and went back to stirring the sauce. Hillbilly bread? I had to ask. Rebecca looked at me and smiled. Regular white bread, a little butter, garlic salt, and sprinkled with cheese. It tastes good with spaghetti. I think that was the smell filling the house. Ingenious. My sister made it for me when I was young, Rebecca said as she peeked into the oven again. This time she grabbed an oven mitt and pulled out a pan of toast. It was golden brown with yellow running through it. She flipped off the oven, which I took to be a very good sign. I think we're ready. What do you want to drink? Why not wine? I have a few bottles and never have a chance to drink them. There are some wine glasses above the stove. I realized the problem with my statement as soon as I said it. Rebecca turned and reached high to open the cupboard. In my mind, I saw broken glass on the stove as she went on her tiptoes. I almost said something then my eyes shifted. Broken glass no longer concerned me. If you took sexy and mixed it with adorable and painted it blue, it wouldn't come close to the exposed tush I was looking at. The t-shirt had ridden up and half of Rebecca's tight but was exposed, neatly covered by baby blue panties. Her legs were taut, emphasizing her figure. I felt desire and didn't want to let go of it. My eyes didn't move fast enough when she came down with the glasses. I was caught perving and felt my face flush. I expected an evil look, maybe disappointment. What I saw was a joyous smile and sparkling eyes. Wine, she asked, waving the two glasses she had retrieved. I came out of my fog and gave her an apologetic smile and headed to liquor cabinet. White Zinfandel okay? I asked. I had a red also, but felt it might be too dry. Fine with me, you can have anything you want tonight. I turned quickly. I was sure she had emphasized anything. I found her back to me, stirring the sauce. I do believe she was flirting. I closed my eyes and saw the blue panties in my mind. I hoped she was flirting. Dinner went smoothly. We talked about silly stuff, and I steered clear of accidents or any other topic that might ruin our happiness. I hadn't had a pleasant night with a woman in years. I found it warming and comfortable. I had missed the feeling. Linda had done more damage than I first realized. Why the fish? Rebecca asked while sipping her wine. I looked over to my aquarium. Mufasa was lumbering up a hill of coral. It was therapy of sorts, I said truthfully. Everything was coming apart in the divorce, so I decided to build something new. I looked back at Rebecca who was staring at me intently. If you get close, you can see a small orange and white fish that swims in and out of the little caves. I named him Linda after my ex. He's a clownfish. I'll take your word for it, Rebecca grinned. I have no intention of getting anywhere near the tank. You afraid of fish? I asked, a little perplexed. They should be afraid of me, Rebecca laughed. The tank is lovely, and I want it to stay that way. I looked at her with concern. I think she truly believed she was cursed. You know. I began and was interrupted by the phone ringing. It's probably my sister, Rebecca said, moving quickly to pick it up. I silently hoped it was not. Hello, she said and waited a moment. Who may I say is calling? At least it wasn't her sister. Rebecca covered the speaker side of the phone with her palm and whispered, Linda Barrow, my ex, I said quietly, I don't want to talk to her. I made an ugly face as if it would painful. Rebecca smiled and nodded. I'm sorry, he can't come to the, oh, phone right now, Rebecca said. The O oh sounded sensual. She smiled at my confused look while listening to Linda's response. No, he's, ah, uh, just fine. Oh, oh, why don't you? Ah, uh, call back in about an hour. Oh God, make that too. She hung up, sounding like she was on the verge of an orgasm. I started laughing. She'll know it's bullshit, I said between chuckles. Doesn't matter, Rebecca said, overly proud of herself. She's a woman. Just knowing there's another woman here willing to bullshit her is enough. I laughed again. She was right. Linda would be envious. It was small of me to like the idea, but I liked it nonetheless. Your insurance company called her thinking it was still your number, Rebecca said. She was calling to make sure the accident wasn't serious. Knowing Linda, she was more likely hoping it was very serious. Well, you were wonderful, I said, tipping my wine glass toward her and the meal was wonderful. That smile again. I walked around the counter and started collecting the dishes. It took us only a moment before we were in a cleaning sink. I washed and Rebecca dried. We had a tendency to touch each other more than necessary. I enjoyed being close to someone again. My mind wandered to the fact I had known Rebecca for less than a day. Most of it was more nasty than nice. She started humming as she dried, seemingly comfortable being next to me. I wondered if my thinking was skewed. I hadn't been with a woman in a while and Rebecca was cute, well beautiful. Linda came to mind. She was beautiful to me once and didn't come with a host of problems. 
We finished the dishes and Rebecca pulled the full garbage bag out of the can and tied it off. In the garage? She asked, holding up the full bag. Let me take it, I said. It's pickup day tomorrow, so I have to haul the can out to the curb anyway. I'll take it out, Rebecca smiled. It's the least I can do. I shrugged my shoulders and allowed her the labor. Thanks. Rebecca hummed her way to the garage and pushed the opener button. There was a loud snap, followed by an even louder crash that echoed through the house. I stood, surprised for a second, until Rebecca's cry brought me to reality. I rushed toward the garage. The washer and dryer unit was leaning forward in the utility room. A large metal spring was protruding through the wall and had put a large dent in the upper dryer. Rebecca was kneeling on the floor of the garage crying. A thin layer of dust was in the air. The garage door was a foot high on one side and off the guides and down to the ground on the other. The old spring mechanism on the right side had failed and snapped off its support violently and driven itself into the far wall. I'm sorry, Rebecca cried, her head in her hands. I'm sorry. She was rocking strangely back and forth. Are you okay? I asked as I knelt down to her. The damn spring could have killed her. I'll leave, Rebecca continued. I don't want to wreck anything else. She was still rocking, which really disturbed me. I wrapped my arm around her and tried to pull her close. She fought me so I let go. You didn't do anything. The damn thing just gave out. I struggled to get her to her feet. She was shaking terribly. There was blood on the right side of her forehead. You're bleeding. Come inside and let me look at it. She looked up at me, her eyes tearing like rivers. I could see the defeat on her face and I hated it. It bothered me more than my car, my jeans or my damn phone. I desperately wanted it off her face. I was at a loss, so I cradled her face with my hands and I kissed her. Her lips were yielding and I could feel her despair. I don't know what I intended, but to linger wasn't planned. My hands slowly entwined into her hair as my lips refused to release her. I felt her surrender and tasted her tears as she tilted her head to better meet my lips. Her lips became stronger. Her hand found the back of my neck. I wanted to live there, in my broken garage. I, I broke your house, Rebecca whispered into my mouth. My house almost broke you. I would have burned it down if it had. Rebecca pulled herself closer, more tightly. I don't want to sleep in the extra room, Rebecca breathed into my ear. I felt her body heat mine. To hell with the stupid garage. I brought her inside and closed the door. I looked at the large spring poking through the wall. It wasn't going anywhere. I sat Rebecca on the couch. My kiss had stopped her tears, though she was still shaken. I retrieved a washcloth and some antiseptic spray. I filled a glass with water and sat down next to her. I had her lie down, her head in my lap. She obeyed without question. She had become completely submissive. I dipped the cloth in water and began to lightly dab the wound. It wasn't deep, and there wasn't any foreign material in it. Some piece must have just flown off when the spring snapped. Rebecca turned her head slightly to give me better access. I dipped the cloth again and made sure all the blood was gone. The wound looked clean, so I shielded her eyes and sprayed the antiseptic. She didn't even flinch. I lightly blew on it. I don't know why. It was something my mother used to do. Stuff like that happens to me a lot, Rebecca said quietly. I caressed her hair and made no move to have her sit up. I like taking care of her. Silly, since I had no desire to take care of anyone else. She turned on her side looking away from me, and tucked her knees toward her chest making herself more comfortable. It caused me to smile. I don't care, I responded softly. I combed my fingers through her hair, and she wrapped her arm over my knees. We sat that way for a while, just being there. It was comfortable. I hadn't been comfortable like that in a long time. I was fired today, Rebecca added to her troubles. I called this afternoon, and they told me I failed to show up for my shift. I continued playing with her hair. The tip sucked, but it was a job. You'll find another one, I said. She curled into me more. I was like a support blanket. I was Carl, just a lot quieter and with a lot more touching. I tried to call my friend Tammy on your phone. Rebecca was dumping everything. She hung up on me. What little I have is at her place. I guess the SUV was the last straw. The last straw? I asked stupidly. Curiosity worked faster than my compassion. Rebecca turned in my lap and looked up at me. Is it okay if I don't tell you right now? Rebecca asked sadly. I felt shitty for asking. Give me her number tomorrow, I said, instead of answering. I'll see if I can't pick up your stuff. Rebecca gave me a weak smile. Homeless, jobless, and seems to think herself a bad omen. I should be running, but even her weak smile held me there. So unlike Linda. That was part of the attraction. I couldn't put my finger on the other part. She rolled her head forward, sideways once again. 
She reached back and took my hand and pulled it over her shoulder and tucked it in with hers. I was truly a blanket. Thank you, Rebecca whispered. I held her because she needed it. I held her because I needed it. I didn't want to be anywhere else. I fell asleep there. Damon. I was startled by Rebecca's voice. I opened my eyes to her wonderful smile. She was still in my lap though she was now completely on her back. She reached up and wiped the side of my mouth. Shit. I was drooling. I lifted my head groggily. Sorry. I said and wiped my lips with the back of my hand. I couldn't feel my legs. They were sound asleep. What time is it? Rebecca lifted her head and looked over to the clock above the fish tank. A little after two. Let's move to your bed. I nodded. I tried to stand. Failed and just straightened my legs to let the blood back in. My brain was still not fully awake. She stood and held out her hand. I took it and stood slowly, then moved my head around, stretching the kink out of my neck. She moved behind me, her hands kneading my neck. I leaned into it. Our bed is over here, I said walking slowly, trying not to separate from her hands. I heard a small giggle. I shut off the lights and walked by memory into my bedroom. Rebecca following closely behind, her heavenly fingers working my muscles. I stopped by the bed and yawned. There was a dim glow from a street lamp coming through the translucent curtains. I turned, trying to think if I had pajamas. I hadn't worn any in a long time. Rebecca's hands went to my collar and began unbuttoning my shirt. I smiled tiredly and stood there as she removed it. I was too exhausted to be surprised when she undid my belt and loosened my pants. She had me sit on the bed as she removed my shoes and socks, then pulled my pants off, leaving me in my boxers. She pulled back the sheets and had me climb in under them. She walked to the other side. I heard her rustle around, then climb in the bed. She scooted close and put her arm over me. I felt her on my side and my mind began to waken. Shoo, Rebecca whispered. Let's just sleep. She spooned into me. Her body pressed into my back. Her hand wrapped around me, lightly caressing my chest. I drifted off again. My alarm, as always, was an a-hole. I was in the middle of some strange dream, not unpleasant, that faded quickly to the incessant, ever louder tone. Nails on a chalkboard. I reached over and slapped the clock a few times until my hand found the snooze. I rolled onto my back, my eyes still closed, and the rich aroma of coffee teased my nose. Rebecca. I sat up and fully turned off the alarm. I didn't remember setting it last night. I spent a few minutes in my closet searching for my robe, the one I hadn't worn in years. When you don't have guests, your modesty wanes. I gave up after failing a cursory search and put on last night's pants and pulled on a t-shirt. The mirror told me my hair was in serious need of a brush. I ignored it and followed the scented trail of Java. I leaned against the corner of the entrance to the great room. Rebecca was busy cooking something in the kitchen. My robe looked a lot better on her than it ever did on me. I liked watching her work. She was so intent on her tasks. I could hear her humming to herself which caused me to smile. She somehow sensed it. Good morning, Rebecca said brightly. Coffee and pancakes? I didn't usually eat breakfast, but the coffee sounded like an excellent idea. Please, I responded and took a seat at the counter. You set my alarm. I stated. Rebecca nodded as she filled a cup with coffee. Cream. Sugar. Black, I responded, shaking my head. Rebecca moved the cup to me with a smile. It all seemed so practiced. I remembered her saying the tips sucked. I guess she had been waitressing. Thank you. The coffee was good. Thick enough to ward off sleep, but not overly bitter. I'm sorry for last night, Rebecca said. I put the coffee down and looked up to her. Her face was sincere, but luckily didn't have the despair I saw yesterday. I'm not, I said. I guess it caught Rebecca off guard. She didn't know where to put her hands all of a sudden. I liked you in my arms. I admitted as much to myself as to her. She turned back to the stove and flipped four mini pancakes. She turned back to me, and I could tell she had found some strength. I don't do well in relationships. They end badly, and I don't know if I can take you not liking me. I raised my eyebrows at her. I saw something starting between us, and she was already looking at the end. She turned back to the pancakes on the stove. Are you trying to warn me off? She nodded to the pan. I took another sip of coffee and watched as she slid the spatula under a pancake to check its color. What if I ignore your warning? I will probably ruin your life, Rebecca replied softly. I tried not to, but a small chuckle escaped my lips. She turned with a little anger in her. The garage won't be the last of it, you know? Everything will be fine and then, wham, you'll wish you never knew me. The thought of you doing a better job of ruining my life than my ex is what I find funny, I said with a smile. 
I'd like to take the risk if you let me. You're just as likely to think me scum in time. I took another sip of coffee while she digested my thoughts. I saw steam coming off the pancakes and pointed my cup toward them. Rebecca turned and deftly moved them to plates. She brought the plates to the counter, along with silverware. It scared me when you called it our bed last night, Rebecca said as she retrieved the butter from the fridge. What? Last night, you were pretty tired, but called it our bed. I had to smile at my Freudian slip. I think I drooled on you too. I laughed. I loved the smile Rebecca returned to me. I can't be held responsible for things I do when I'm half awake. I spread some butter on my pancakes. I wasn't really hungry, but she made them for me. So, you didn't mean it? Rebecca half teased. I stalled for a moment, then thought, what the hell? I love that we slept together in our bed, I said confidently. I quickly filled my mouth with pancake, forgetting the syrup, to avoid having to speak further. Rebecca was trying desperately to hold back a smile. I could tell she wanted to remain serious, thinking there were future ramifications we needed to discuss. Finally, she gave in. It was nice, wasn't it? Rebecca's smile was beautiful. I nodded and grabbed the syrup. The pancakes were good, but I loved sugar. I made pancakes for dinner about once a month just to get a sugar fix. She stayed my hand when I started to pour, leaned over the counter, over my pancakes and kissed me. I couldn't swallow my mouth full of pancake fast enough to lengthen the kiss and had to let her recede. You want to try that again, I said brightly once I swallowed. Rebecca shook her head with a sly smile. I let her have her fun and doused my pancakes in syrup. I was hungrier than I thought. I'm going to need to take the next couple of days off, Bob, I said into the phone. Bob Thorgon was a sensible boss. I have had a few who were less than reasonable, but Bob knew I made him look good when I could. The spring on my garage door snapped off and shot through the back wall. The door won't open and I have to fix the hole. I listened for a moment, watching Rebecca squirm uncomfortably. I think she thought I was risking my job or something. Sure, I can do that Monday, but I want Susan there. Last time she left me in the dark. More listening. Okay, see you Monday. I hung up and smiled. For day weekend. They just let you leave like that? No notice. Rebecca said, surprised. Of course, shit happens that people have to deal with. I responded casually. Rebecca must have had some really shitty jobs. They'll just take it off my PTO hours. I'll get paid for the time off one way or the other. I opened the phone book and glanced through the yellow pages looking for a local garage door company. Hanson's overhead door is really good, Rebecca said. I glanced up and saw her cheeks redden. I've had a few that needed fixing, she said sheepishly. I smiled to soften her supposed shame. Hanson's it is then, I said as I found them in print and called. When I had described the problem, they knew instantly what the issue was and were quite familiar with it. I was told they would be out within the hour with a new torsion spring assembly to replace the old extension spring system. I passed this on to Rebecca who still seemed to think it could only have happened to her. We spent the next hour working the spring out of the wall. It was an awfully greasy thing. We scooted the washer dryer into the great room to create some room to work. It took only a second for the spring to find its way into the wall, but 15 minutes to get it out without tearing half the wall down. It wanted to catch on the drywall every step of the way since it went in at an angle. It also weighed a lot more than I had expected. In the end, I had a nice one-foot gash in my drywall. I guess I should be happy it didn't take out a stud. Hansen's was very efficient. They disassembled the door, reset the guides, built a frame to hold the torsion spring assembly, and rehung the door. In the middle of it all, I got my rental car out of the garage. The door was slightly misshapen in the lower left corner, but it was a garage door and you couldn't see the problem from the road, so I decided to live with it. It's bent, Rebecca said sadly as she looked at the door. You can only tell from up close, and it's not that bad, I said. You almost have to know what happened. It was an old house and deserved to look lived in. Rebecca shook her head slowly, then headed inside. I think she would have preferred if there was no sign of the incident ever having occurred. I looked at the door again and now the crease was all I could see. Women. I chased down Hanson's team before they pulled away. They told me someone from sales would call about replacing the door or just the panel if they could still get the same style, which they doubted. The panels were as old as the house. I suspected I needed a new door. Rebecca was expensive to have around. You were right, I told Rebecca once I was inside. I have them pricing a new door. She looked at me with a funny expression. You did that for me? You thought it looked like crap, I said. I looked again and agreed. I thought she would be happy about it. Why did I just ask for a new door? I could have lived with the dented one. It did look bad, but I thought you were going to live with it, Rebecca added. You didn't like it so I decided to replace it. Are you trying to impress me? 
Rebecca asked. There was a challenge in her tone that confused me. I think she was trying to pick a fight over fixing a bent door. I really didn't want to fight over the damn door. Yes, I guess I was, I said firmly and put my hands on my hips. Rebecca smiled as she moved close. I could see a sparkle in her eyes. I am impressed, Rebecca said and kissed me. This time I didn't have a mouthful of pancake. I wasn't going to be satisfied with a little peck. Not after her bent door teasing. I pulled her into me. Our lips at first caressing, then pressing, then sharing. I felt the tip of her tongue tickle my upper lip. I could feel her heartbeat strengthen, and a heat rose through my core. Oh, Rebecca breathed as she separated from me. That was more than expected. I wanted to devour her right then. I stopped, not sensing I had permission to continue. It was something in her posture. I dropped my hands to her hips, less aggressive, but still sensual. I didn't want to lose it all. Too fast? I asked. No and yes, Rebecca answered cryptically. I meant to kiss you. I just didn't think. I liked it more than, we've only known each for a day. Her floundering was adorable. I could see it in her eyes. I was as much an enigma to her as she was to me. I released her hips. There was no danger of losing her right now. I have to get something at the hardware store to patch the wall. I'll pick up my phone and see if I can't get your stuff from Tammy's. I paused for a moment. You know I'm going to spend most of the day trying to figure out how to impress you again. Rebecca laughed. I'll try my sister again, Rebecca said. She looked serious for a second. I'd like to stay tonight, even if I find her. I would love for you to stay. I loved her smile. This time I allowed a simple peck. I drove to the phone store first. Life was different without my mobile. It was not unpleasant. I just felt undressed without it. Almost off balance without that little rectangle bulging out of my left front pocket. I was the only customer. It was the first time I had ever been there and was waited on before I could say hello. We have it in the back, Mr. Richardson. It will just be a minute, the young techie said before he disappeared into the back room. I walked around aimlessly, looking at a rack of phone covers. I had one once, but didn't like how thick it made the phone. I laughed inwardly, thinking a cover may have saved my phone when Rebecca dropped it. I started to go over to the tablet displays, and my foot caught on something. I absently pulled harder without thinking. There was a slight screech, and I turned in time to see the six-foot display of hundreds of phone covers fall in slow motion to the floor. My feeble attempt at reaching out to stop it was entirely too late. When it crashed, the covers scattered like scared mice across the floor. Three of the employees came out of the back room with looks of shock. My foot was still caught in the bottom of the rack, and my attempts to stand the rack back up seemed to be making the problem worse. I'm sorry, I said quickly. I'm not sure what happened. Don't worry, Mr. Richardson. The techie said as he handed me my phone. We'll take care of this. His tone was condescending, and I was in no position to dispute it. He kneeled down and untangled my shoelace from the stand. The other employees began gathering the scattered cases. Look, I'm really sorry about this, I repeated. He waved me off without saying a word. I felt like an idiot. The other two were avoiding my eyes. I made my exit, with embarrassment tingling in my spine. I sat in my rental car for a few moments letting the feeling subside. If anything, I knew part of what Rebecca felt like. It was inwardly painful, burning deep into the mind. Rebecca must be deeply burned inside. I could be her aloe, that much I could do. At least it was nice to have a phone again. The thought made me remember to call Tammy. It was a brief conversation. For a moment, I thought Tammy would hang up on me, but she was willing to allow me to pick up Rebecca's stuff as long as Rebecca wasn't going to be there. I thought it was pretty childish. I intended to tell Tammy, once I had Rebecca's stuff loaded, I got the address and disconnected politely. Tammy lived in an apartment complex. She had a place in the back on the fourth floor. It was a gated establishment with a guard out front who insisted I show an ID to enter. I smelled money, though I thought it was wasted fencing out the world. I parked in a guest spot, close to the door the guard indicated would be best. I had to speak into an intercom before Tammy buzzed me in. Tammy was a heavy woman. Not a two-plane ticket woman but someone who really likes her meals. She spent a lot of money on stationary hair, the type that is curled, then glued in place on the top of her head. It looked like her dirty blonde hair wouldn't have moved in a hurricane. She was much older than Rebecca, but what surprised me was her kind smile. How is Rebecca? Tammy asked. I wasn't ready for the question. I suspected the here's her shit now get out message. Upset, I answered truthfully. She wants to talk with you about it. I wanted to add a small tirade about human decency, but her kind face was too disarming. Yeah, it's kind of unlike me, Tammy responded. Kathy thought it best not to encourage Rebecca to rely on me anymore. 
She knew I would cave if I talked with her again. Kathy? I asked surprised. What kind of crap was going on? Kathy? Her sister. I couldn't reach Rebecca's cell two nights ago. After the insurance company called. So I called Kathy. Something sounded wrong. But I let it sink in and followed Tammy into what looked like a guest room. The apartment was bigger than my house. It looked like she had paintings on the wall worth more than my house. These two boxes are hers and those three suitcases. Tammy sighed. Not a lot to show for her life. She shook her head slowly. The fire kind of zapped the drive out of her. I grabbed the first box and headed to the door. Here, this will let you back in. Tammy slipped her key card into my back pocket since my hands were full. I loaded the first box in the trunk and returned to the apartment. So, Kathy said you shouldn't talk with Rebecca anymore? I asked casually as I went for the second box. She thinks Rebecca needs a lesson in self-reliance. Tammy said while nodding. Rebecca has had a rash of incidents, and people keep bailing her out. I am the worst of the bailers. I lifted the box, a little dubious of the psychology involved. So, you two were just going to leave her in jail? I asked. Jail. No one said anything about jail. Her eyes went wide. Oh, the poor girl. How long was she there? Just a night, I said as I headed back to the door. A few minutes later, I was back up for the suitcases. I'll call Rebecca, Tammy said when I returned. I didn't know anything about jail. It was the third accident with one of my cars. I was a little angry. I was going to leave the problem to Kathy. She's been taking care of Rebecca since they were kids. Tammy looked a little embarrassed about the jail part. Shit, I'll be lucky if the guy she hit doesn't sue me into the next century. The swearing didn't fit what little I knew of Tammy's personality. I could tell she felt guilty about ignoring Rebecca and was trying to justify it. Yeah, I joked. I hear the guy's a real a hole. The expression on Tammy's face was priceless, but I couldn't keep a serious face. I laughed and added, I'm not suing anyone, just keep the lawyers away. I've had my fill for lifetime. She hit you? Tammy smiled. Yep, I said as I lifted two of suitcases, then added without thinking, kind of a love tap. The word shocked me inside. It was just a misused cliche. I hurried with my load down to the car. I returned for the last suitcase and found Tammy pouring two glasses of wine. Sit, Tammy said, pointing to a chair. There was concern in her voice. Please. I sat and she handed me a glass of white wine and took the seat opposite me. Love tap? It's just a saying, I said. The wine was pretty good. Tammy looked at me in a strange way. Rebecca needs someone. I just don't know if it is the guy she hit with a car. I became confused and somewhat irritated. I set the wine down and stood to get the last suitcase out of the guest room. Sorry, I said that wrong, she said. You think it's best to ignore her and now you question me, I said, trying to keep my tone civil. I'm not sure if Rebecca needs friends like you. Please, Tammy said, pointing at the seat. You're right, of course. I sat back down, but left the wine where it was. I just don't want to see her hurt. I shook my head. I'm confused. She's old enough to make her own decisions. I looked around the apartment at the art and expensive furniture. Why do you care? Rebecca didn't seem to fit with Tammy. I was missing something and I wasn't sure I even cared to know. I was friends with her mother, Tammy admitted. Very good friends. When she passed away, I promised to keep an eye on Rebecca, that's all. So you ignore her? I wasn't sure I wanted to be there any longer. Tammy sat back in her chair and studied me for a moment. What do you do for a living? Tammy asked, ignoring my question. Excuse me? I said as stood again. I think I'll just finish loading and be on my way. I had no idea why she switched to interrogation mode. None of it made any sense, and I decided I would prefer ignorance. I moved to the guest room and retrieved the last suitcase. I handed Tammy the key card as I was walking out. Please don't hurt her, Tammy said as she took the card. It was a plea, a desperate one. I looked at eyes that were wetter than they should be. I almost reminded her, again, that she was the one doing the hurting. I thought better of it. I just nodded and headed down to the car. A strange woman, that one. I next went to the hardware store. I talked with someone who seemed knowledgeable and then gathered joint compound. Some wood for furring strips, mesh drywall tape, and a quarter sheet of drywall. I had to laugh. The quarter sheet cost almost as much as a full sheet. My mudding skills left a lot to be desired, but the hole was behind the washer dryer. If it wasn't perfect, nobody would know. I came home to find the house smelling like a pine forest. The kitchen was sparkling clean. I could see myself in the stainless steel handles of the appliances. I called to Rebecca and heard a weak reply from the bathroom. I found her there, inside the shower scrubbing away at my years of hard water stains. What are you doing? I asked. 
Rebecca was wearing another of my old t-shirts, and I could see she had worked up a sweat. She smiled when she saw me. I'm just repaying your kindness. Besides, your bathroom was a little gross. You don't have to do that, I said. As I looked at the gleaming sink and pristine toilet, I couldn't remember the last time the shower doors were fully transparent. I'm not going to stop you though. It looks so damn clean. I guess the bathroom was a little gross. I opened the shower door. Thank you, I said and kissed her smiling lips. A wet, chemical-smelling hand wrapped around my neck and pulled my lips back to hers. I felt my heat rising again as her lips parted slightly and her tongue began to explore. I almost slipped as I stepped into the shower, and she broke the kiss, laughing. Let me finish this, Rebecca said, giving me another quick kiss. Her face lost its smile, and she looked into my eyes. I want to be with you tonight. It's entirely too soon, and I don't care. I smiled, my blood rising more than it should. I quelled my impatience. I'll start on the hole in the wall, I said as I stepped carefully out of the shower, and try hopelessly to keep my mind on the job. I loved Rebecca's sly smile. I turned and walked back to the garage to unload the car. All I could think of was her. She was becoming more attractive as her confidence increased. I kept trying to imagine what was under that t-shirt. I tried to develop a picture in my mind of the body I had felt last night. I wondered if her panties were still blue, or had she changed to another color, or none at all. My mind was a sewer, and I wanted so much to wallow in it. I measured the hole, and cut a rectangular piece of drywall to cover it. I placed the piece over the hole, and traced around it with a pencil. I used a handsaw to enlarge the hole to fit the piece perfectly. I cut two furring strips a little taller than the hole, and screwed them to the inside of the drywall on both sides of the hole, thus building a frame to attach the piece. I put the piece in the hole, and screwed it to the furring strips. I was overly proud of my work. You've done this before? Rebecca asked. She had come up behind me as I was working. Nope. The guy at the hardware store told me how to do it. I won't even tell you what I was planning before I talked with him. Looks professional, Rebecca complimented. I put mesh tape around the seams where the drywall patch met the wall. The phone rang. It was finally Rebecca's sister. No, Kathy. I'm fine. No, I am staying here tonight. She looked up and smiled to me. I knew what that smile meant. Damon Richardson. No, he picked me up yesterday. Rebecca's eyes rolled as she talked. It's not like that. No, well, he's kind of the guy I rear-ended. No. Rebecca brought the receiver away from her ear and gave me a frustrated I currently dislike my sister look. Rebecca listened for a moment longer, then covered the phone with her hand. She wants to meet you, she whispered. I shrugged my shoulders and nodded okay. Sure. Rebecca continued with her conversation. Tonight? Rebecca looked back at me. I nodded and pointed at the kitchen counter. How about dinner here? Rebecca nodded to me and proceeded to give the address. A moment later she sighed and hung up the phone. Sorry about that, Kathy is kind of protective. I smiled so she would know I didn't mind. What should we make? I asked. I had little in the way of good dinner food. I could do pancakes, spaghetti and can chili, but those didn't seem appropriate. Shopping trip? I'll cook, Rebecca said in agreement. With a four-day weekend, there was no reason to finish the hole today. I cleaned up the mess, covered the half-repaired hole with the washer slash dryer, and took Rebecca to the grocery store. Some women brighten when you take them to a jewelry store while others find a shoe store the greatest experience. The grocery store was Rebecca's destination of choice. Her whole demeanor changed when the door swished open. She didn't even turn around to look at me when she pointed at the carts. I grabbed one and followed her. Rebecca was a closet gourmet, and I was her lackey. Watching her shop was simply amazing. Her brain held some menu, and she seemed to know exactly what she needed. She grabbed some lettuce, butterhead, and red leaf. I pointed out the convenient bags with lettuce already ripped into nice, edible bites. Rebecca laughed. Not with me, but at me. She gave me a quick kiss to soften the chastising. She gathered some red cabbage, raisins, walnuts, and a small container of raspberries. Not the iceberg and ranch I was used to. I always liked raspberries so I was going to remain open to the strange salad concoction. We picked up a two-pound sirloin tip roast. She added cayenne pepper and olive oil to the cart. I was informed I already had the other necessary ingredients. I knew I had a one at home, though I don't think she meant that. We had to go back to the salad dressing aisle. It seems we had forgotten red wine vinegar. I was busy reading the vinegar label, wondering why it was so special, when I felt a pair of arms circle me from behind. A pair of happy lips kissed my neck. Thank you, Rebecca said softly. For what? I said, hoping she wouldn't let go of me. Everything and allowing my sister to come for dinner, Rebecca whispered. 
Her lips tugged on my ear, and her hands caressed my chest. I almost dropped the vinegar. I tried to turn in her arms, but she released me and took a step back with a devious smile. You're teasing me, I warned with the best intentions. Yes, was all she said, though her eyes made promises. I laughed as she took my hand in the cart and headed to the checkout lane. She was watching me, her eyes alive, as she drove the cart right into a corner display, and a tower of cereal boxes came tumbling down. Not just one or two, but the whole damn rack. I watched life drain from Rebecca's face, and her confidence fly away. I thought it would be fleeting, but it lingered past a second, and I saw lines begin to form around her eyes. Her body jerked when the rack hit the ground. People turned and Rebecca began to recede into herself. It physically hurt to watch those few seconds. My muscles strained and my throat thickened. I could not let it continue. I pulled Rebecca into my arms. She didn't struggle as my lips found hers. My intent was to be there with her and let her forget. It only took a moment as the grocery store faded away. Her hands found me and pulled me closer. I drifted with her, her soft lips embracing mine, through a world of our own making. She returned to me, stronger and more alive. Excuse me, sir, a man in white smock said to get my attention. I separated slowly from Rebecca. Her eyes were sparkling, and my heart leapt to see it. I looked to the man, a grin glued on my face. Sorry, I was distracted. I said, the cart kind of got away from me. The man looked between Rebecca and me and smiled. Rebecca's arm wrapped around my waist, and she leaned her head on my shoulder. She felt so comfortable there. No problem, sir, the man said on the verge of a chuckle. If you pull the cart back, we'll get this cleaned up. I pulled the cart back as the man gave me another look. It was the you lucky son of a witch look. Damn right, I thought. The house smelled delicious. There was an exquisite smell of slow-cooked meat hanging in the air. My mouth had been watering, and Rebecca wasn't letting me near my own kitchen. It was strange that I was letting her do it. I actually liked the idea that she had claimed a domain and declared herself dictator. I enjoyed the confident Rebecca. That smells wonderful. I complimented as I sat on the other side of the counter. You would make a good chef. That's my dream, Rebecca admitted. I always end up waitressing in the end. It wasn't depressing sounding. She was just stating fact. Start your own restaurant. I continued as Rebecca placed the lettuce she was tearing into a big bowl. Kind of need money for that, Rebecca said. Half a million just to build it and half that again to keep it going the first year. She had put some thought into it. I don't even think I could help her borrow that kind of money. Maybe, before the divorce, but now I was lucky to get a good rate on a car loan. The doorbell rang and ended the discussion. Kathy was much older than Rebecca and I couldn't see much family resemblance. Kathy's expression was severe when I greeted her. I felt I was being analyzed, and it was a foregone conclusion I would be found wanting. Her face brightened when Rebecca came out of the kitchen to welcome her. There was something about Kathy I didn't like. I had expected to be vetted by her and knew that wasn't it. Something was off. Her sudden change when Rebecca appeared didn't feel genuine. Their age difference was disturbing, and I disliked the way Rebecca seemed to defer to her with her posture and altered mannerisms. It was not a good start, so I decided to let my reservations go and begin anew. I am glad you're here, I said, smiling. Rebecca's cooking has been teasing my nose for over an hour. I wasn't sure I could hold out much longer. She cooks for you? Kathy questioned in a less than a friendly manner. Rebecca didn't seem to notice the tone. I, on the other hand, did. It's kind of tough to stop her, I responded in a neutral tone. I was done with being pleasant. It took me less than a minute to decide this was going to be a long dinner. I reminded myself to not be unpleasant. The last thing I wanted to do was to come between Rebecca and Kathy. I sensed Kathy didn't have the same fears regarding me. Rebecca pulled the roast out of the oven, and I no longer cared what Kathy thought of me. It was a wonderful looking piece of meat. I don't think I really appreciated my oven enough. Rebecca lifted it out of the Dutch oven it had been kept warm in, with a large fork and knife. I could see the pride in her eyes as she handed the platter to me to carve. The rub she had put on the meat increased the savory smell. I could almost taste it with my nose. I began to cut into the meat and suddenly felt like my father at Thanksgiving. The whole situation felt domesticated. I looked up at Rebecca's smiling face, my barbecue apron around her waist. The ultra-clean kitchen, memories of her cleaning the bathroom and grocery shopping had snuck up on me. Three days after my divorce was finalized, and I was feeling way too comfortable with another woman in my house. Rebecca saw something in my face. I could see worry building so I shook off my thoughts and added a smile for her. Kathy seemed to miss it all. I cut into the meat and found perfection. It had a warm pink center and the juices flowed. 
I had to give Rebecca credit. She could cook. I left the A1 in the fridge. So, what do you do for a living? Kathy asked me as dinner progressed. I was chewing when she spoke. The meat was almost melting in my mouth. Maybe the domestic thing wasn't so bad. I work for Bradford Insurance and Casualty. I answered once my mouth was free. I work in the computer department. I usually don't go past that much. A fuller description bordered on boring. How long have you worked there? Kathy continued her interrogation. I guess being Rebecca's only family, it was her right. Nine. No, ten years now. I replied as I stirred my salad around a bit. I was looking for more raspberries. The dressing Rebecca made went well with the raspberries and nuts. Not a mix I would ever have thought of. Do you aspire beyond insurance? Kathy continued. Rebecca surprised me by scooping some more raspberries out of their container and into my bowl. Mind reader. There's a career path there, I answered after smiling my thanks to Rebecca. I am vested and happy, so I see little reason to move on. Must not pay well, Kathy said with no reservations as she looked around my small house. My first thought was death by fork. I pulled back and decided the whole truth was necessary, lest she find out from a different source. I went through a protracted divorce, I confessed. It took a toll on my finances. Everything is stable now. You were married? Kathy asked with disdain, while looking at Rebecca. I guess she suspected Rebecca to be shocked. Rebecca just smiled softly and nodded. Yes, for nine years. I replied then quickly added, we were separated for the last four years. It was finalized a few days ago. My, you do move fast, Kathy said. She quickly filled her mouth with salad as if the comment was an inconsequential afterthought. Stop it, Rebecca said forcibly, staring at her sister. I was glad it wasn't a spineless relationship. In fact, it made me feel better. I didn't like the idea of a helpless Rebecca. I smiled and decided to defuse things before we sank into a series of jabs we would regret. Kathy is just worried about you, I said nicely. I don't blame her. I just defended Rebecca's sister for questioning our relationship. Everything was moving at breakneck speed. I put some more roast in my mouth to give me time to think. I was letting things get defined by default. That is a beautiful aquarium, Kathy said to change the subject. I think she realized she had dug a little deeper than necessary. She decided a little diplomacy was in order. It was nice to see her white flag go up. We spent the rest of the dinner discussing the care and feeding of saltwater fish. Kathy enjoyed watching Mufasa lumber about. It is strange how your opinion of someone can change when they take an interest in your favorite things. Rebecca tried to start cleaning the dishes when we finished. I insisted she sit. She cooked. I would clean. Also, the idea of her cleaning again kind of ate at me. It was better to equalize things and hold on to some independence. Kathy surprised me by grabbing a towel and insisting on drying. Rebecca was pleased. You're moving too fast, Kathy said quietly when Rebecca headed off to the bathroom. I knew she didn't mean the dishes. Shouldn't you be talking with Rebecca about this? I asked and handed her a clean bowl. She took it and began to dry. Already tried, Kathy answered. She's vulnerable. The fire and the accidents have damaged her confidence. I would be happier if she came back with me tonight. At least she was being honest. I thought for a moment as I washed a plate. Everything was moving quickly. I also knew the comfort was strangely frightening. I shook my head. We do well together, I stated, handing her the clean plate. I chastised myself for fearing comfort. After you're done banging her, she'll be crying at my door, Kathy said with cruelty. I wondered how long it would take to drown someone in a kitchen sink. I stopped washing and took a deep breath. I'm going to ignore that, I said stiffly. I continued washing the plate I had been working on. No, I had reconsidered. You need to trust Rebecca. If my intentions were as slimy as you think, you wouldn't even be here. Kathy took a step back as I shoved the clean plate at her. She took it gingerly. I guess I had some evil in my eyes. Sorry, Kathy stated firmly and dropped the towel on the counter and placed the wet dish next to it. I wasn't sure what she was sorry about. Rebecca walked back into the kitchen, which quickly ended the conversation. Let's take a walk, Kathy said, with a forced smile at Rebecca. Rebecca looked to me and I nodded my head that it was all right. The two headed out the front door as I breathed a sigh of relief. Kathy was not my favorite person. I finished the dishes and sat on the couch waiting for the ladies to return. I wasn't pleased with the evening so far. I had expected to get grilled, but not judged harshly. I poured a glass of wine and put on some music. I closed my eyes and leaned back, trying to let the stress vacate. Lips were the first thing I felt. Soft and wonderful, they woke me from my brief nap. I opened my eyes to see Rebecca's smiling face as she straddled me, her knees on either side of my thighs. Where's your sister? 
I asked as my memory flooded back. I sent her home, Rebecca replied. She insisted you were going to use me for sex and then throw me out. Her face went serious. You're not going to throw me out, are you? I would never throw you anywhere, I answered. Rebecca's lips found mine again, passionately parting to tease me with her tongue. I responded, caressing her back and pulling her closer. Her lips trailed across my cheek and slowed near my ear. I really hope you plan on using me for sex, Rebecca breathed into my ear. My pants tightened quickly at her words. I had to clarify something before my will was no longer mine. I didn't bail you out to have sex with you. It sounded stupid coming out of my mouth, but I really needed to say it. I felt a smile on my cheek. And I'm not having sex with you for bailing me out, Rebecca whispered. I simply want to be naked with you, Damon. I had never heard words like that from any woman. There was absolutely no doubt of her desire, and I knew mine. My meat was straining as I pulled her lips back to mine. I devoured them as I desperately pulled her shirt out of her pants. She laughed and helped me pull her shirt over her head. Her bra was next. I fumbled with the clasp in the back as she stared into my eyes, smiling. My God, you are beautiful, I said truthfully. Rebecca stopped trying to step out of her shoes for a second and looked at me. All her curves were exactly where I thought they should be. Her smile grew, and she awkwardly began stepping on her heels again to dislodge her shoes. We made wild love. That was kind of amazing, I whispered into Rebecca's ear. She was dead weight in my arms as she recovered, still laughing. I reached up and massaged her neck softly as I smiled at whatever she found humorous. What is so funny? I asked. My sister, Rebecca said as she sat up. She kissed me deeply. She said we weren't compatible, that it would be boring. It certainly wasn't boring, I added. She cradled my face with her hands and kissed me again. She put her forehead against mine and stared into my eyes. I don't think your sister likes me, I said with humor. Rebecca smiled, moving her hips up and down, teasing me. Ignore her. I am. She just wants me to move back in with her. The thought of Rebecca possibly leaving struck me harder than I expected. I didn't have the right, but at that moment, I was in my personal heaven and didn't want it to stop. I don't want you to leave, I stated. It sounded more like a plea than the request I intended. So, you like using me for sex? Rebecca smiled. I think you used me. I laughed. My mind flirted with the desires I fully intended to deploy if she decided to stay. You do like using me for sex, Rebecca stated. Her eyes were sparkling. Yes, I admitted, very much. Rebecca hugged me close like she intended to never let me go. I let my fears go as she held me. I decided to ignore self-imposed waiting rules. I liked her more than I should. I truly didn't want her to leave. I had made love to a woman with the lights on. Twice. I had done that only once with Linda. With Rebecca, it seemed natural. Rebecca was so unashamed about her body. Nature was just nature around her. She held no concerns about sharing herself with me. I was more than satisfied to just have her near me. I really didn't want her to leave. I want you to stay here with me, I said firmly. Ask me tomorrow, Rebecca responded, smiling. When I have clothes on, I chuckled at her sensibility. My request will stand, I smiled. But for you, I will gladly ask again tomorrow and the next day if necessary. I already knew I wanted her to stay, naked or not. It is too fast, Rebecca stammered. It wasn't fear. It was the same confusion I felt. It was entirely too fast. It was also entirely too strong. It was also all I desired. I sliced some of the leftover roast into small pieces. I had woken up before Rebecca and had a desire to make her breakfast. Making omelets was the one cooking skill I possessed. I had no idea if a steak and egg omelet would excite her taste buds, but it had mine watering. I had the pan warming on the stove at three on the dial. Cooking omelets was a temperature game. If you got it right, you had firm yellow eggs encasing the guts. If you got it wrong, the eggs turned brown or were runny. Neither was very appetizing. Good morning, Rebecca said sweetly. She had snuck up on me. I looked up at an angel in another of my t-shirts. Her hair was going every which way but where it was supposed to go. My heart leapt at the sight. No sunrise could compare to her. I dropped the knife on the cutting board. I want you to stay here with me. I repeated my request from last night. Rebecca wasn't fully dressed, but I desperately didn't want to forget. Okay, Rebecca replied with a smile. That was settled. So my apprehension died away. Good morning, I said, pointing to a stool. Coffee? Please. Rebecca answered as she sat down. I'm making steak and cheese omelets, I added as I moved to the coffee pot. Sounds delicious. I love you, I said stupidly as I poured her a cup of coffee. The silence frightened me for a second, 
and I turned to find her only an arm's length away. Her lips answered me. Words were no longer necessary. The world made total sense. Rebecca and her sister had a rather heated phone conversation after lunch. I left Rebecca to argue with Kathy, not wanting to get in the middle of two sisters. I already picked the winner anyway. Instead, I went back to fixing the hole. I put a layer of mud over the mesh tape on the drywall. I was rather impressed with my work. I went into the garage and duplicated my efforts on the other side of the wall. I had to shift some insulation around to try to preserve the thermal barrier. Other than that, it worked out as well as the inside had. Very nice, Rebecca commented. As I finished the mudding in the garage, she was still wearing only the t-shirt she donned this morning. Kathy still upset? I asked, knowing the answer. I was rather surprised how adamant her sister had become. It seemed so out of character for a sister to carry it so far. She'll live. She played the mother card, and it failed. So she's pouting. The mother card? You know, how disappointed my mother would be if she were alive today. That type of bull. Rebecca said offhandedly. Was your mother like that? I don't know, Rebecca responded softly. She died giving birth to me. I heard a little sadness in her voice. Kathy was trying to be Rebecca's mother and doing a lousy job of it, but I suddenly had some sympathy for her. Kathy raised you? I asked, putting down my tools and moving toward her. I realized I knew so little about Rebecca's life. Yes, Rebecca answered, pulling me into a loose embrace. She was already in her twenties when mom died. I think I was an accident, she chuckled. I kind of still am. The sadness was for never knowing her mother. I always wondered if I would have been different if she hadn't died. Then you wouldn't have rear-ended me, I said, smiling. Rebecca's hands dropped down to my hips and she squeezed. I do like your rear end, Rebecca joked. She was in a playful mood. I was hit with a wonderful desire to see her squirm. I quickly put the lid on the drywall mud and grabbed Rebecca's hand. She followed me willingly, her smile indicating she shared my desire. I brought her into the bedroom and pulled the t-shirt over her head. I was wrong. She wasn't naked underneath. She was wearing a pair of baby blue panties. She saw where my eyes were looking and turned. You like my blue butt, Rebecca insisted, as she wiggled her butt at me. I saw you checking me out that first night. I laughed and slipped my thumbs into the elastic and helped her shimmy out of them. With a little dominate revenge, I pushed her lovingly onto the bed. The session was amazing and I had never been that happy. I have fears, Rebecca said. Honesty was in her eyes. I am scared I will hurt you one day. I don't think I could handle you hating me. I was saddened that she still thought herself cursed. I wished I could just reach into her and yank that idea out of her. I could never hate you, I said softly. Linda flashed in my mind. I wondered if I felt something similar with her when we first met. I didn't want it to be a lie. It won't be on purpose, Rebecca continued. I want you to know I would never hurt you on purpose. I wanted it to stop. She was admitting defeat before battle was even envisioned. I pulled her lips to mine and tried to love the thoughts from her mind. For whatever may happen, I whispered in her ear, I forgive you. I felt her smile form on my cheek. Her hand began stroking me and her lips nibbled on my neck. I sucked in my breath, not expecting the passion to continue. You're a fool, Damon Richardson, Rebecca breathed. My lovely, lovely fool. The feeling climbed quickly, her breathing so close to my ear. Her soft hand and the love I felt. I love you, she whispered. She was mine. Joy and passion exploded in me. What a lovely mess it was. My phone rang during dinner. I was going to take Rebecca out for dinner, but she preferred to cook. She found some fresh halibut at the store and masterfully created a peach and pepper salsa for it. I thought it sounded ghastly. I tried it out of love. It was to die for. Rebecca was born to tantalize taste buds. I looked at my phone and saw which barrow as the caller ID. I quickly answered, kicking myself for not changing Linda's contact info back. You didn't call me back, Linda started. Not even a hello. Nope, I answered. I knew the one-word response would piss her off. I don't know why that pleased me. I promised myself I wouldn't hate her anymore. You with someone? Linda continued. I smiled at my gorgeous chef. Yes, I responded like an a-hole. Rebecca smiled back to me. The same one who screwed with me before? Linda asked, more softly this time. Yes, I said then added. It was just a joke, sorry. Are you happy? Linda asked. It sounded contrite and very unlike her. What's wrong, Linda? I asked in response. You can't live with someone for years and not know when something was off. Rebecca's eyes widened when I mentioned Linda's name. I feel like shit, Linda admitted. I had so much anger and now, well, I regret most of it. 
I wondered what parts she didn't regret. I want to make sure you aren't wallowing in it too. She would never come out and ask. It just wasn't her way. I forgive you, Linda, I said, and I hope you feel the same. I watched Rebecca shift to a puppy dog uh, expression which almost made me laugh. It would have been very bad timing. I do. I have, Linda said excitedly, and Damon? Yes. Tell her she's a lucky girl, Linda said pleasantly, then hung up. After four years of hate, Linda had found her humanity again. She wanted to make sure I didn't hate her. It felt good to let her off the hook. It was a bonus that there wasn't a spark of hate running around the world with my name on it. At least we were able to split that 50-50. Linda want you back? Rebecca asked, smiling. That ship sailed over four years ago. She just wanted to make sure I didn't hate her. I think she was feeling guilty. You don't still have feelings for her? Rebecca queried. She was testing me, carefully. I rolled through my recent call lists on my phone and showed it to her. She covered her mouth and laughed. I guess which barrow had its uses. Don't get jealous. I'm changing it back to Linda as a gesture of peace only. Rebecca laughed and nodded. I started the correction. I always hated the little digital keyboard. It made simple things, like a name change, a chore. If you can put up with my sister, Rebecca compromised, I'll not hold Linda against you. Maybe we should make peace with Kathy too, I offered. I completed the name change and put my phone away. She'll need a few more weeks, Rebecca said stubbornly. She's convinced Tammy that you're no good for me. Tammy called you? While you were in the bathroom, Rebecca replied, they both think I'm your sex toy. I smiled and bit my lip. I was about to say how right they were, but thought Rebecca might take it the wrong way. Male humor didn't always translate well across gender boundaries. She said she was good friends with your mother. I fed Rebecca, trying to find out more about her life. I didn't want to force direct questions. Rebecca didn't seem fully comfortable with her past. I certainly didn't want my curiosity to ruin things. That's what I am told, Rebecca continued. She always seems to be there when Kathy and I need her. Kathy won't admit it, but I think Tammy helped us financially for many years. What about your dad? I asked, then kicked myself for the direct question. My curiosity moved faster than my compassion. Luckily, Rebecca didn't seem to mind. I don't think my mother knew. I think she was a player. Rebecca didn't seem to feel any shame about it. I had some pictures, before the fire. Other than that, I know practically nothing about my history. No grandparents, aunts or uncles. Just Kathy. Then we'll give her some time then invite her out to dinner. Neutral ground. I strategized. Rebecca smiled and held out her hand across the counter. I took it in mine. I am so glad I rear-ended you, Rebecca admitted. I laughed. The four-day weekend went by too quickly. We were able to sand and paint the patched wall. I could hardly tell there was ever a hole in it. Rebecca was able to get the stains out of the couch cushions. She also rearranged the entire kitchen. I was made aware of how I had screwed up in choosing the silverware drawer. To me, it made no difference at all, other than it made her happy to move it. I was happy with that. Work seemed fresh that morning. I guess that went with my new outlook on life. I knew what was waiting for me when I got home. I was in a meeting I had promised to attend and Susan was there as was promised to me. It was a re-evaluation of a website that our department had developed. The users weren't happy with the speed, so everyone from hardware, networking, and programming was there. We were halfway through with Bob's hardware report when the receptionist, Mary, came in with bouquet of a dozen roses in a heart-shaped face. I figured it was someone's birthday or anniversary. Mary passed the ladies and went straight to me. What's this? There for you, Mary smiled. It was a humorous smile. I looked at the flowers, then back at Mary's flushed face. You brought them in here? Why not leave them on my desk? Mary shook her head, her smile growing larger. She pointed to the note card sticking out from between the buds. I took it off its plastic clip. To, my sex toy from, your sex toy I love you. Broken garage door my butt. Mary laughed. Susan, who had been reading over my shoulder, tried to stifle her laughter and failed. I, quickly as I could, stuffed the note in my pocket. I felt heat rise to my cheeks. Who is she? Susan asked. I ignored her question. Ah, I have to get these into water. I lied as I rose. Can we break for five? You have to tell us who she is. Susan laughed as I hurried out. Mary followed me to my desk. You like her? Mary inquired. I had never really discussed more than the weather with Mary before, and now she was acting like my trusted friend. I turned, more embarrassed than I should be. Yes, I sighed, a lot. I surrendered to the obvious. She's claiming her turf, Mary chuckled. She handed me a card. That's a same-day florist. Send two dozen back. I am sure I look confused. 
She's letting everyone here know she has dibs. There are rules you know. Send twice as many back. Mary turned and almost walked into Susan. Sex toy? Susan asked quietly, with a smile I didn't deserve. Mary had a private chuckle with Susan. That's one hell of a no trespassing sign. Susan continued as she leaned over and smelled one of the roses. What's she like? Both were looking at me intently. Suddenly my sex life was everyone's business. The sex toy is a private joke, I said quietly. Talking over cubicles wasn't exactly private. So you haven't? Mary asked. I must have turned fifty shades of red thinking about Rebecca naked. They both started a new round of laughing. Flowers. She had to send me flowers. It's not like that, I said louder than I intended. I love her. My mouth quicker than my brain. Neither Mary nor Susan seemed shocked, both still smiling. She's a lucky girl, Susan said. Two dozen, Mary reminded me. They both walked off giggling. I plopped in my seat defeated, picked up the phone and ordered two dozen roses. Lunch was strange. I usually just headed out to a sandwich place and brought it back to my desk. Sometimes, I would mix it up and have a burger. This time, as I was walking back to my cubicle I was waylaid by Susan. She insisted I join her in the break room. I couldn't comfortably decline, though I really wanted to. Mary and a compliance officer named Trudy were sitting there, seemingly waiting for me. I had spoken with Trudy before when I designed some phishing queries looking for anomalies in our databases. I was going to be interrogated by polite busybodies. I sighed as I sat down. What's her name and how did you meet her? Mary started. I had six eyes on me, waiting for my answer. I slowly unwrapped my sandwich to give me time. Then I gave in and spilled. The whole story sounded so asinine as it came out of my mouth. They all looked on intently as I described the events as they unfolded. They had me clarify some issues then I would go on. I ended at the point where the flowers came in. She rear-ended you, tried to blackmail you, lost your favorite jeans, you bailed her out of jail and she broke your phone and your garage door. Her family hates you, and you love her? Susan asked incredulously as she summarized. Yes, I said, and then smiled at the stupidity of it all, completely. It's adorable, Trudy said. It's insane, Mary contradicted. You've only known her five days. She's homeless and unemployed. I nodded. There was no arguing with the truth. Are you sure you aren't rebounding from your divorce? Susan asked. I looked at all three of them. Trudy was smiling. The other two looked concerned. I like Trudy's smile. My marriage was over four years ago, I said, looking at Trudy. I have no idea why I connected with Rebecca, but I have. I couldn't stop now if I wanted to. See, it's beautiful, Trudy added. Looking between Mary and Susan, she's rearranged the kitchen. Well, she is in it for the long haul, Mary agreed. I was beginning to get lost. Susan saw it. It's her kitchen now, Susan said, smiling. The flowers, the kitchen, it all means the same thing. I obviously missed the book on female mating behavior. If you find your sock drawer moved, then you better get a ring, Susan laughed. It didn't bother me. It should, but I saw no downside to Rebecca marking her territory. In my mind, I had already claimed her. I smiled at the thought. See, Trudy said, nodding at me, you haven't even scared him off. In fact, they had solidified my thinking. I took a bite of my ignored chicken salad sandwich. All three of the women were watching me closely as I chewed. I swallowed hard, before I had fully chewed. The spotlight does that to eating. Why are you so interested? I asked. I didn't think I was worthy of more than a hello before the flowers. The ladies looked at each other and grinned. Sex toy, Mary chuckled. Rebecca, sounds like she's having more fun than we are. My cheeks got warm and I took another bite of my sandwich and tried to look away. I think they enjoyed my embarrassment. Does everyone have to know about that? I asked desperately. All three smiled and nodded. I guessed I was what passed for entertainment at an insurance company. I love my flowers, Rebecca said as she swallowed me in her arms when I walked in the door. I could smell something delicious cooking in her kitchen. I made a mental note to check my sock drawer. She then kissed me like I had been gone for a month. My flowers were wonderful as well, I said, enjoying Rebecca in my arms. I like the idea of coming home to her. Here, this is for you, Rebecca said, handing me a check. It was from Tammy for $3,000. What for? I asked as I read the check for the second time. For my bail, Rebecca answered smiling. Tammy dropped by for lunch and insisted. You weren't here to refuse, so I accepted. But, I'll get the money back when you go to court, I added. I had already written off the service fee and didn't want to upset Rebecca by mentioning it. She likes to do things for me, Rebecca said. She's rich, so let her. I wasn't sure I would cash the check. 
I'm not much for gifts of that size or the feeling of being in someone's debt. Rebecca seemed to take it in stride. Does she always do things like this? I asked, then smiled to ease Rebecca's mind. My whole life, Rebecca responded as she led me to the kitchen. She likes your fish, by the way. I looked over to see Mufasa lying calmly on the bottom of the tank. Tammy and Kathy were a strange support system for Rebecca. I was hoping I might be a bit more stable, or at least more predictable. Dinner is almost ready, she said brightly. Smells wonderful, I said, setting the check on the counter. I'm experimenting, Rebecca said, and you're my guinea pig. Pork chops stuffed with pesto. She pulled two sizzling chops out of the oven. It really sounded gross, smelled amazing. I knew I was going to eat it, even if it tasted horrid. I prepped my taste buds and went to grab a strong wine, just in case. Why didn't you ask Tammy to stay for dinner? I asked as I fished in the wrong drawer for a corkscrew. Rebecca pointed at the drawer next to it. Strange how we didn't need words. Sure enough, the corkscrew was exactly where she put it. I did, Rebecca responded as she transferred the chops to plates. She said she was busy. Rebecca gave me a sly smile. I think she was meeting her lover. I had to smile at that. A lover? I would have thought she was married. Her lover is, Rebecca laughed. She placed some green beans and mashed potatoes onto the plates. The potatoes looked like they had some kind of cheese mixed in. I never pictured her that way, I said honestly. I was thinking back to my quick meeting with Tammy. She seemed too proper to be fooling around with a married man. Maybe it was just the rich decor in her apartment that made me feel that way. She's been his mistress for years, Rebecca continued. I think that's where her money comes from. God knows she doesn't work. Rebecca put a plate in front of me, and I traded her a full glass of wine. I looked at my pork chop and the somewhat ugly-looking greenish nutty substance leaking out of it. I won't even get into what it reminded me of. I was losing confidence in my ability to fake enjoyment. I wondered if Rebecca would be insulted if I doused it in a one. Rebecca confidently cut into her chop, swirled the piece of meat in the pesto, and took it in her mouth. I was patiently waiting to see if she gagged. Imim, much better than it looks, she said as she went for another piece. I wasn't sure if she was trying to fool me. I hesitantly picked up my fork and chickened out. I went for the potatoes and happily enjoyed their cheesiness. The green beans had some kind of crunchy, seasoned stuff mixed in. That was also very tasty. At least I wouldn't starve. Rebecca smiled at me. You're afraid of it, she said sweetly. I knew what she meant. What? I feigned ignorance. I didn't like my cowardice much at that point. Rebecca just tilted her head and smiled. I caved first. It's just how it looks. I tried to be kind. I'm working my way up to it. She rose and walked over to me, still smiling, though she had a sneaky look in her eyes. I'll get to it, I said, trying to defend myself. I really wasn't relishing her feeding me like a child. She stuck her finger into my pesto stuffing, scraped it off onto her tongue. I had to admit it looked pretty good on the end of her tongue. She kissed me, deeply. I instantly became a great fan of pesto. The pork was the perfect platform for the pesto to shine. It was a shame Rebecca had only made two, though I was allowed to eat half of hers. I made her promise to make it again. I am going to be a fat guinea pig at this rate, I said as we began washing the dishes. I'm working on your exercise plan, Rebecca said with a serious face. I looked over as I handed her a plate to dry. I didn't see any humor in her eyes. I don't really go for the workout thing, I said. I figured she might as well know now. I'll do some walking or biking, but no schedule. I only had one life to live, and I wouldn't be spending it sweating in a gym. Shame, Rebecca said. I was enjoying our naked workouts. There was that smile. It was a few hours later before we returned to finish the dishes. My aerobic heart rate had been raised sufficiently. Carl met me for lunch the next day. We met at a bar and grill near his office. I usually didn't drink during the working day, but with Carl you make exceptions. I always got a kick out of seeing him in a suit. It is so counter his personality, it was almost humorous. By the time I got to the grill, he was on his second beer. Damon, Carl called loudly as I neared the table. I'm glad you decided to wear pants today. Damn, the man had no inside voice. Half the restaurant was looking over at me, grinning. Carl, I said, a little more quietly. I forgot to thank you for picking me up that night. Next time I'll call someone else. Carl laughed which made me forget my embarrassment. We ordered some sandwiches and a couple of beers. So, she's living with you. Yep, we kind of hit it off. You mean she hit you, Carl said, shaking his head and grinning. So much for bachelorhood. You lasted, what, 24 hours? It was a really long day, I added. Our beers arrived, and Carl toasted to my stupidity and then to a lucky girl named Rebecca. That's why I liked Carl. 
He joked about your idiot moves, but never judged them. He was simply there for me. She's got a strange family, I said when we relaxed. A sister who doesn't like me much, and a really rich friend who seems to care too much. I showed Carl the check. That's from her friend, to offset the bail money. You going to cash it? I would. Always wanted a rich friend myself. Rebecca says I would insult Tammy if I don't. I guess I'll stop at the bank on the way back to work. I don't feel real good about it though. Three grand is three grand. Don't insult the lady. Introduce her to me. That would be insulting, I joked. Carl laughed and then drank down half his beer. You love her? Carl asked as he set his mug down. Yes, and I don't know why. Everything says run, but I am glued willingly in place. Sex will do that, Carl claimed as I took a sip. I almost sent beer into my nose trying not to laugh. I knew he waited until the, the beer was in my mouth before he spoke. Sex and good cooking, I added. Once I had wiped the beer drool off my chin. Sexy chef with a rich friend, Carl summarized. I'm thinking you hit the mother load. It's not just the sex, I said. I want to be near her. I don't want her anywhere else but in my house. Go with it, Carl encouraged. You deserve to be happy and I need more happy friends. I really wished I didn't have to go back to work that afternoon. If I could, I would wallow in beer with Carl. I owe you one, you know? Without you, I would never have survived the divorce. Anytime, my friend, Carl said, and waved the waitress over for another round of drinks. I found a job, Rebecca announced as I walked in the door. I felt her joy and gave her a congratulatory kiss, then another. She was wearing my Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man t-shirt and little else from what I could feel. Where? Whitressing, but it's a job, Rebecca continued. It's on the bus route and not too far away. She held up my Ghostbusters boxers. Change, I have an exciting night planned. Her smile was delicious. And only the boxers, she added as I headed off to the bedroom. I was liking where this was heading. Rebecca had the crockpot on the coffee table. Next to it was a plate with a chunk of sharp cheddar, surrounded by crackers. There were two cans of beer and a couple of plates waiting. I found your Ghostbusters DVDs and figured we would have a picnic in front of the TV, she said with a proud smile. I really liked where this night was heading. I thought you said the movie wasn't that good? It's all in who you watch it with, Rebecca countered. She pulled the lid off the crock pot and I saw the oddest looking mini pigs in a blanket warming inside. She picked one out with her fingers and put it to my lips. The mini wiener was covered in a much darker breading than I had seen before. They looked almost overcooked. Rebecca smiled and pushed harder until my lips parted and I bit down. Pretzel heaven. The wieners were baked in a pretzel breading. The crockpot suddenly looked too small. These are delicious, I said rudely, with mouth full of half-chewed pretzel wiener. I loved the smile that caused on Rebecca's face. I had to learn to trust her cooking. She violated every edible principle I had, but never ceased to make love to my taste buds. Finger food tonight, Rebecca said and flipped on the TV. Somehow, she had figured out the myriad of remote controls and fired up the stereo tuner and Blu-ray player. Perfect, I said, smiling as I sat down on the couch. I had to shove a few folded towels off to the side. I gave Rebecca a quizzical look. Don't want to ruin the couch, Rebecca said in a sultry voice. Now I was sure there wasn't anything under that t-shirt. Absolutely perfect, I rephrased. We curled up on the couch and watched the movie, feeding each other, laughing and not always paying attention to the screen. Rebecca had fun teasing me by flashing, rubbing, or simply being sexy. I had fun being teased. We were at the scene where the pencil neck was shutting off the containment grid. Rebecca, obviously, couldn't care less. She smiled at my rapt attention to the screen and her head dropped into my lap. The impending demise of New York City no longer held my interest. I was still smiling from Rebecca's movie night. It had been a few days ago, but still kept me warm at work. I thought it deserved some original thought on my part. I spent some work time surfing until I found a gourmet cooking convention in Indianapolis for the coming weekend. Rebecca wasn't supposed to start her new job until Monday, so I booked a hotel room and purchased some tickets. I was anxious about my surprise when I drove into the garage. For the first time since Rebecca had moved in, there was no smell in the air. Nothing cooking. She wasn't there to meet me at the door. The house was dark except for the blue glow of the fish tank. I called out, receiving silence in response. She hadn't told me she would be out. Not that we were married, but something didn't feel right. I flipped on the light and moved to the bedroom, thinking I had caught her napping. My head snapped to the right before I felt it. The whole left side of my face exploded in pain and I lost my vision. My knees wobbled as I nearly dropped to the floor. A large form moved in front of me from the hall. 
and my stomach caved in response to a fist. I went down on all fours before my hands could come up. I tasted blood as I gasped for breath. A foot drove into my stomach, turning me over and driving bile into my mouth. Three men, none of whom I recognized, stood before me. One was smiling, one spit on me, and the other had a knife at Rebecca's throat. I got money. I spit out as much blood as words, don't hurt her. The smiling one stepped on my wrist, putting all his weight on it. Only the carpeting was saving the bones. Listen, shit. The man who had spit on me said, Mr. Gordini doesn't appreciate you spending time with his woman. The statement was followed by a kick to my side. I felt my ribs give, and all I could do was grunt. Maybe we should spend time with yours, the man continued. I heard Rebecca squeal in the distance. Anger filled me. I gave up on my wrist and rolled into the leg atop it. I surprised myself by freeing my hand without breaking it. I rose slightly and twisted into the man's knee bringing him down. I kneed him in the stomach and drooled blood on his clothes. I began to rise. It was my house, and they were threatening all that I loved. A knee caught my chin and drove my head back. That was followed by a fist that took my balance from me. I crumpled back to the floor, my head swimming in waves of tar. I tried desperately to rise again. My left eye was swollen shut and blood was pouring from my mouth. Two sets of arms pulled me to my feet. I tried to struggle, but my muscles weren't responding. I could hear Rebecca crying out, perhaps a mile away. I suddenly picked up speed, my right eye seeing nothing but blue fish tank. My head hit sideways and water sloshed out of the top. I collapsed, feeling warm wetness run into my ear. Shit, one of the men said, the damn thing didn't break. I tried to raise my head. My neck wasn't responding to the command. No, please don't do it, Rebecca screamed. I heard glass shatter and a flood of salt water covered me. I looked up and saw the smiler with one of the kitchen stools in his hands. He was laughing. Go near Miss Simpson again, and you and yours are dead, the smiler said and threw the stool over the counter and into the kitchen where I heard something break amongst the clatter. The name was familiar, but my foggy brain couldn't identify it. I tried to say, who the hell is Miss Simpson? but only blood bubbled from my mouth. I began to choke on it, so I forced myself to roll onto my side to drain my throat. I saw a bleary image of Rebecca held by the third man. I reached out for her. With no strength left, my arm collapsed on top of a flopping mafasa. I felt a deep stab in my arm. Damn, I thought clumsily, killed by my own fish. Raging fire burned into my arm. A deep blackness swallowed me. I heard my name in a fog. I tried to open my eyes but they wouldn't respond nor would my hands when I tried to wipe my eyes. I tried to listen, to fully wake my mind. She blames herself. They say he will recover. She moves back. Only fragments. I half recognize the voices. Like a radio that just won't fully grasp a frequency, my mind drifted. It's for the best. I'll watch him. I wasn't sure how time flowed as I retreated back to darkness, unable to fight any longer. Good morning, Mr. Richardson. The voice was cheerful. I heard curtain rings being slid along their rail, and my eyelids brightened dramatically. I blinked slowly, my eyes feeling the light as pain. The doctor will be in shortly. She hopes you will be awake. The voice moved closer. I made out a olive green shape, linear, without the curves I expected attached to such a pleasant voice. I coughed as I tried to speak. My throat cleared what felt like a week of backup. My mouth was dry, but my eyes began working better. I looked up into a practiced smile her blonde hair pulled tightly back away from her face. The eyes were intelligent and saw none of the confusion I felt. Good morning, I gargled out. I sounded old and coughed again. I'm Julie, morning shift, she said clearly, almost like she expected me to be a little slow. Do you know where you are? My eyes glanced around. Hospital room, a couple of blinking consoles, basic white sheets and beige walls. A double window, curtains open, letting in way too much sunlight. My head began to pound. Hospital, I answered, a little more coherently. I waved my hand toward the curtains. Can we close those damn curtains? The light seemed to be burrowing directly into my skull. If you promise to stay awake, Julie said, and moved to close the curtains without waiting for my agreement. How long? For days, Julie smiled. Rather, this will be your fourth. Rebecca? I asked as I looked around. The room was empty. A knife at her throat was the last thing I remembered. I tried to sit up. My chest protested with pain and my head swirled. Is Rebecca all right? I don't know who that is, Julie answered. You were admitted alone. She pushed me gently back into the pillow. You're not going anywhere, but we do have a phone. Guilt racked my body, 
Thoughts of Rebecca being handled by those men I couldn't stop. Visions of what may have happened tore through me. I hated those thoughts. Police, I need the police, I pleaded. I tried to sit up again, but Julie had all the leverage, and a strong pain in my chest was fighting against my strength. The police will back again this morning, Julie said, applying more pressure to my shoulders. For days. My God, she could be dead. I was worthless. I just let them have her. I reached up with both hands. My chest was tortured with a dagger-like pain on the right side. I ignored it and pushed Julie's arms off my shoulders. I sat up with an audible grunt. Please, Mr. Richardson. Julie lost all her confidence and took a step back. You have to remain still. My feet got caught in the sheets as I tried to swing them off the bed. More pain as I bent over to pull the sheet out of the way. Everything hurt as I maneuvered my legs off the side. Julie had her arms outstretched, trying to stop me. I stood, and the world began to flip around in sweeping circles. Nausea filled my belly, and I lost balance. Julie grabbed me, pushing me back to sit on the bed. Slower, you have to go slower, Julie pleaded. I had no choice but to listen. My mind and body refused to follow my instructions. I need the police now, I demanded as Julie helped me lie down. The pillow cradled my head softly, and the spinning room began to slow. I was too weak, then and now, all worthless. Tears flooded my eyes, daggers piercing my chest as I sobbed. They should have just killed me. I'll call them, Julie sighed as I finally settled into the bed. I couldn't stop them, I blubbered. Relax, let the drugs wear off. She grabbed a cloth from next to the bed and began wiping my face. Everything will be clearer soon. I couldn't stand up, much less walk. I need my phone, I said, looking at the white nightstand expecting to see it charging. Julie moved to the drawer and pulled it open. She retrieved my phone and handed to me. It was of course quite dead. I need a charger, I said, lucidity appearing from the fog. A woman entered wearing the same olive green smocks the nurse was wearing, covered by a white lab coat. You're awake, the woman observed. I'm glad to see that. Awake and anxious, doctor, he tried to get out of bed. And how did that work out for you? The doctor asked. I didn't like the humor in her tone. She wore brass-rimmed glasses and looked over the top of them, waiting for my response. I need a damn charger, I replied, waving the phone. I never memorized any numbers, much less Rebecca's. I needed my contact list. Julie, see if you can find a charger that fits his phone. She looked back to me as Julie took my phone out the door. There, first problem solved. The doctor continued. Thank you, I shouted toward the door, suddenly remembering my manners. I doubt Julie could have heard it. You're going to be disorientated for day or so, the doctor said, while glancing at her tablet. I've taken you off painkillers. If the pain gets to be too much, let me know and we'll talk about reinstating them. The pain kept me awake. I needed to stay awake. The doctor smiled, looking up from her tablet. Sorry. I'm Dr. Betty White, she added. Hello, I am Damon Richardson, I responded. You're my first lionfish poisoning, Dr. White said. I had to consult a colleague in Florida to verify the treatment. Consultations meant money. This was going to cost. I shook the monetary thoughts from my head. Rebecca Morrison was with me when I was attacked. What happened to her? There was a woman here when you first came in, Dr. White said as she moved toward the head of the bed. I didn't get her name, though the front desk should have it. She spent most of her time crying, though she was physically fine. If she isn't family, they wouldn't have let her stay. It must have been Rebecca. No one else would be crying for me. I was partially relieved. Dr. White took a small flashlight out of her pocket and told me to stare at a spot on the ceiling. She flicked the light to and from my eyes. You've suffered a concussion as well as the effects of the terroir venom, the doctor continued. I feared you might have cerebral edema, but we ruled that out. Just a concussion. I don't believe you will have any lasting effects. You may want to stay out of fights for a few months. She smiled, thinking her obvious statement was funny. You have a broken rib and bruising along your abdomen. That's going to make it painful to move about for a while. She lifted my arm and showed me a large red splotch where Mufasa poked me. I have been assured the discoloration is temporary. She examined it closer, like I was a lab rat. She let my arm drop. We would like to keep you here until we are assured you gain adequate mobility or you have a caretaker at home. So, nothing permanent? I stretched my back and felt the sharp pain in my chest again. No, though it would be wise to take it slow and seek medical advice quickly if you sense a problem. There's always a chance of an internal injury we may have missed. Julie returned with a charger. This is one of the nurses, Julie said, while she plugged it in the wall. He gets off in three hours, so you'll have to give it up then. I felt some of my helplessness leaving. 
I had my phone again. Thank you, I said honestly. Julie smiled and attached my phone to the cord. The telltale beep of the power connection being made was not there. The phone would need a few minutes to start charging. I'll get some food sent up, Julie said, smiling at my thanks. I'm sure you're hungry. My brain sorted through the pain in my stomach and separated the bruising from the hunger pains. I realized I was famished. Sorry about earlier, I offered. My rudeness bothered me now. I wasn't sure how Julie put up with it. Forget it, Julie said. Obviously pleased I apologized. Drugs have that effect. A Detective Williams will be here in about 30 minutes. I nodded, feeling it in my chest. Even simple movements reminded me I was hurt. Julie held up a call button, attached to a cord, and set it on the nightstand next to the phone. Push this if you need to use the bathroom. One of us will make sure you get there in one piece. Your dizziness will begin to fade today, Dr. White added. Tomorrow it should be manageable, though it's not unusual for it to stick around for a few days. I'll check on you in the morning. Just try to relax as best you can. Thanks, Doc, I said. She left me with Julie who handed me the TV remote. I couldn't remember the last time I watched daytime TV. Julie left, promising to send breakfast. I put the TV control off to the side and grabbed my phone. It was responding slowly to my commands to turn it on. I waited impatiently for it to boot. When it finally came up, I found Rebecca in my recent call list and initiated the call. I had expected to hear her voice, but was put in voicemail instead. I rambled out a fairly coherent message mentioning my worry and my love. I begged her to call back. I tried three more times before the detective arrived, my worry growing with each failed attempt. What do you remember? Detective Williams asked after our brief introductions. Did you speak with Rebecca Morrison? I asked anxiously. Yes, the night of the assault, Williams replied. She's the one who reported it. She was okay? I continued my line of questioning. Distraught, of course, but unharmed. Relief washed through me at the detective's words. I hadn't realized how much tension I was holding in my shoulders. She was convinced it was all her fault, though she couldn't tell me why. I got the feeling she thinks trouble follows her around. I felt the tension return. I wasn't there for her. She was blaming herself with no one to hold her. Do you know where she is? I rambled. I'm trying to call her. I'm sorry, but no, William said sadly. I assumed he sensed my anxiousness. I have a phone number and an address for her sister. He went a little pale, realizing he may have said too much. My mind reeled. She wouldn't be home when I got there. Maybe she just didn't want to stay there alone. I wish she would call me. She had to be scared. Can you tell me what happened? Williams continued, trying to get back to his job. I dumped everything thing I knew, which wasn't much. My descriptions of the attackers eliminated about 80% of the Earth's population, leaving only about a billion people to sift through. The mention of the name Gordini sparked some recognition in his eyes, though he let me continue uninterrupted as he took notes. I almost mentioned the name Simpson when the name clicked. It was on the check I cashed from Tammy. It was her last name. I didn't give a shit about her, but I definitely didn't want to burn any bridges until I had Rebecca in my arms again. Rebecca knew. No wonder she thought it was her fault. Maybe it was. I didn't care. Life without her would have no color. I stashed the name away and kept it from the detective. That's similar to Rebecca's account, the detective said. She must not have heard Gordini. He said it with incredulity. I ignored the tone. Do you know Tony Gordini? He asked. I don't know any Gordinis, I answered honestly. If I showed you some pictures, do you think you would recognize your assailants? Williams asked. I might, I replied. Who's Tony Gordini? He put his notebook away and sighed in my general direction. Honestly, Williams said quietly, someone you don't want to recognize. You certainly don't want to date his girl, he chuckled a bit, or his wife. I didn't see anything funny. I don't even know his girl, I returned with irritation. They were in my house. I don't give a damn who he is. The detective's smile disappeared. He reached in his pocket and withdrew a card and handed to me. Here's my number, Williams said. Call me when you are out of here and we'll go over the pictures. He didn't seem like he really wanted to continue the investigation. If we can prosecute them, they are looking at a year for home invasion and assault and battery. A year didn't seem long enough. He emphasized the if. His whole tone was trying to discourage me. You aren't filling me with confidence, I said, my irritation now fully undisguised. They have good lawyers, Williams said. Shit, if I'm letting this go. I almost yelled. Yeah, okay, Williams said sadly. I guess you won't. You have my card. Call me when you're ready. He turned to leave then suddenly turned back. Do yourself a favor, look up Gordini before you come by. He left quickly after that. 
I called Carl. You're sure about this? Carl asked as he pushed the wheelchair down the hall that evening. He thought I should spend another night. He had been shocked about the whole situation. At first, he wanted to gather some friends and go find the a-holes. After I mentioned Gordini, he mellowed quickly. I didn't need the internet. Carl was familiar with the myth that was Gordini, the crime lord. He ran the city, or at least its underbelly. Tammy was likely his mistress, that much I had put together. Why he thought it was necessary to keep me away, I had no idea. I didn't really care anything about Tammy, except that she might be able to point me to Rebecca. Rebecca wasn't returning my hourly calls. Just get me out of here, I answered quickly. Carl was quite clear that I looked like shit and reiterated his desire that I spend another night. The hospital staff wasn't overly happy and thought I should clear it with Dr. White. I insisted, and they were forced to grant my demands. I conceded to using a wheelchair to end the argument. Man, this girl isn't good for you, Carl said, shaking his head. I love her. I hope you don't love her to death, Carl chuckled. I laughed. It hurt. I exited the wheelchair as soon as we hit the parking lot. I was walking a little funny, trying to use my legs without over-twisting my torso. Climbing into the car was painful, but I could manage. At least the dizziness had abetted. Tammy will know where she is, I said as Carl started the car. He rolled his eyes. I'm not taking you to see the Godfather's girlfriend, Carl stated. I shook my head. Nope, I'm going alone. Tammy won't answer my calls. I'm not letting you go alone. Look, I don't know what's going on, but showing up with backup seems stupid, I said and looked over as Carl backed out of the spot. It's not like either of us could stop these guys. I'm just hoping I can reason with them if it comes to that. I don't think you can take another beating. Who am I going to drink with if you they give you a pair of cement shoes? If they wanted me dead, I would be. I'm thinking it won't come to that. Come on, even the cop tried to warn you off. I love her, I said again. It kind of explained it all. Okay, Carl conceded. But I better get a bachelor party out of this. I smiled. Strippers, lots of strippers. I laughed. It hurt. My house was dark when I arrived. There was a strong scent of chemical cleaner in the air. I flipped on the lights. My broken fish tank sat on its stand, empty of all water. I called out for Rebecca. There was always hope. It was met with silence. The carpet had been cleaned, and any remnants of my swimming friends were gone. Rebecca must have cleaned up. I squatted down and felt the carpeting. It was dry. There was a note on the kitchen counter. Carl saw it first and read it. His expression wasn't pleasant when he handed it to me. Damon, I caused too much pain. I won't allow you to forgive me. I am untouchable. Rebecca. The pain I felt in my chest was nothing compared to the one in my heart. I could not control my eyes and turned away from Carl. My angel was lost, hurting, and I wasn't there. This wasn't her doing, and if I had to cut through the entire mob to get to her, I would. Screw the syndicate, Carl said. We'll find her. I plan to. I hadn't slept well. There isn't such a thing as a comfortable position when you have a broken rib. The best I could do was lie flat on the floor, covered in a few blankets. I paid for it in the morning. Standing up, my stiff body brought tears to my eyes. I let out a couple of good groans, attempting to expel the pain. If it came to a fight, I was finished. Screw it. Rebecca was worth it. I showered, letting the warm water wash over me. If I stood still in the falling rain, I could actually forget about the pain and think straight. I had to get to Tammy's apartment door without her knowing, past a guard and the front door. The front door seemed easy enough. I could just be patient and follow another resident in. The guard was a more difficult problem. If he called Tammy, I would never be let in. I smiled when a plan formed. I finished and spent a painful few minutes drying off. I called my boss who was sympathetic and allowed me to use more PTO. Not like he really had a choice. The hospital gave me the cover I needed. I hung up and called back, this time connecting to Trudy, the one woman who seemed to really support Rebecca and me. I dumped everything to her. There was no point in asking for her help if she was uninformed. You're crazy, Trudy said seriously. I'll do it, but you better not end up dead. Tammy Simpson at Gardenway Apartments on Grand? Yes, and thank you. I owe you big. Lunch, Trudy said, and all the details. I am living vicariously through you now. I laughed. Lunch, you pick the restaurant. With that settled, we said our goodbyes and I spent the next 30 minutes getting dressed. Each piece of clothing cost me dearly. I dreaded the last pieces, socks. I was seriously thinking of just doing shoes, but life had to go on. I was determined the beating wouldn't change my life. I opened my sock drawer and found it empty. The drawer below it was also empty. The third drawer held my socks, all pairs balled together neatly, 
piled in rows according to color. Rebecca had moved my sock drawer. The ironic implications didn't escape me. She didn't want to leave. She had been taking over. I gritted my teeth, grabbed a pair of socks, sat on the bed and donned them like I would have, had I not been wounded. I groaned through the pain, intent on forcing my body to acquiesce to my demands. I did the same with my shoes. I simply ignored the pain. It was painfully liberating. I looked back at the empty drawers. They should be filled with Rebecca's clothes. They would be holding baby blue underwear if it was the last thing I did. I stood with determination. It was time. Mr. Richardson to see Tammy Simpson. I said to the guard as I handed him my driver's license. I was wearing sunglasses to try to hide my black eyes. I didn't really care if they had a record of my visit. I only needed a few minutes with Tammy. Miss Simpson called earlier, the guard said, handing me my ID. Go right in. I smiled. Trudy had handled the impersonation beautifully. I would have made a good crook. I thanked him and parked next to the door and waited. It took a few minutes before I could follow a tenant into the building. It was an older woman carrying groceries. Someone up there was looking out for me. The woman was grateful for my help as I helped her with her bags. We had a small talk in the elevator, and she tried to get me to stay for lunch. I declined politely as I put her bags down in her kitchen. I don't think she ever realized I didn't belong in the building. My acting was getting good. She never even noticed the pain carrying her bags caused me. I knocked on Tammy's door, two floors down from the grocery lady. I heard shuffling behind the door as locks were opened. I purposely stood off to the side, so the peephole could only view the side of my head. I don't think she even looked. Tammy's greeting smile dropped quickly when she recognized me. You can't be here, she said in a panic and tried to close the door. I shoved my foot in and winced when the edge cut into my gym shoe. Seems it would be fully painful day. She stopped pushing. You have to leave. Where is she? I demanded in a level tone. I didn't want to rile the neighbors. Tammy tried to close the door again. This time my anger rose. I pushed the door open which forced her back. I stepped in and closed the door. Tammy closed the robe she was wearing. Where is she? I asked again, a little louder. I wasn't leaving without the information. Tony Gordini entered the room, from the bedroom hallway, in a t-shirt, boxers, and black socks. Tammy gasped. I recognized him from pictures I saw on the internet. His gray hair was plastered in place, expensively shaped at some salon. His face was grim, and he had a hand behind his back. He moved toward me without any apprehension. I stood my ground, though running crossed my mind. He was a good five inches taller than I and had me by at least 50 pounds. Who the hell are you? Tony demanded as he stopped out of arm's reach. He didn't sound like he was used to being ignored. I had not planned for this. Tammy had stepped back out of the way, her hand covering her mouth. Her eyes held fear. I was screwed, so I went all in. The guy you had beat up last week, I said, removing my glasses to expose my blackened eyes. A smile crossed Tony's face as he raised his hidden hand, pointing a gun at my head. Can't take a hint, Tony stated calmly. I could tell he would have no problem pulling the trigger. I also sensed that he would enjoy it. I saw Tammy out of the corner of my eye. She mouthed, I'm sorry. I turned my head toward her, ignoring the gun. I had seen lips move like that before. Exactly like that. My mind took in her eyes, lips and chin. Her weight hit it well, but the similarities were unmistakable. Her odd concern for Rebecca confirmed it. My mouth moved before my brain could stop it. You're her mother. I spilled my revelation, my mouth hanging open in shock. Tammy's eyes went wide, and I saw the truth in them. She looked at Tony. Tony looked between us both. Tammy's mouth tried to move, but nothing came out. She feared Tony more than I did. Tammy? Tony asked sharply. He wanted to know what the hell was going on. Tears were forming in Tammy's eyes. She tried to blubber an answer, but nothing intelligible was coming out. The gun shifted from me to Tammy. Tony didn't like not knowing what was going on. I could see he was a borderline megalomaniac. Tammy was sobbing, holding her hand in front of her face as if it would stop a bullet. This was nothing like I envisioned. My anger flared at the stupidity of it all. I shifted between Tony and Tammy. Do you shoot everyone who pisses you off? I asked with more anger than I should have displayed. And why the hell did you have your goons beat me up? I added, since I was on a roll. Tony smiled and adjusted the gun until it pointed between my eyes. I'll shoot you for breathing in my direction, Tony said. The gun was steady as a rock. He had no problem with shooting me at all. The beating was a warning you ignored. I don't like male hookers screwing my woman. I tilted my head and laughed. Tony grimaced. He wasn't used to being laughed at. I love her daughter. I said to Tony like he was an idiot. 
Why the hell would you think I wanted Tammy? Tony ignored my question and oddly pointed the gun over my shoulder at Tammy. What daughter? Tony demanded. I shifted again to keep the gun pointed at me. Tammy was bawling. Tony was taking the idea of a daughter as an insult. I was screwing this up rather well. Tony put the gun at my belly. I'll shoot you both if you don't get out of my way. I didn't move. He would shoot us both anyway. Put the gun down, I ordered. I began to reach for the gun figuring he would have pulled the trigger if he had really wanted to. His left hand moved faster than I expected and wrapped around my throat. He turned my body and slammed me up against the wall, my chest exploding in pain as my rib shifted. The gun moved to my head. Screw you, he said. I had pushed too hard. I could see his finger tightening on the trigger. Your daughter. Tammy screamed. I felt Tony's hand loosen on my neck. His expression changed to one of confusion. I started breathing again. We both turned to Tammy, her mascara running down her cheeks. Your daughter, she repeated softly. Tony let go of me, and the gun dropped to his side. Why did you pay him 3000 Tony said, pointing the gun at me as if it were a finger. He bailed your daughter out of jail, Tammy answered. Her own anger rising now that the truth was out, I was paying him back. Tony looked at me, then took a step back and laid the gun on the counter. How, when? Tony asked, looking at Tammy. When you did the two years for the bribery charge, Tammy sighed. She was an accident. I tried to have her raised in secret. I just couldn't stay out of it. Why would you hide this from me? Tony was getting angry again. The man was on a bipolar roller coaster. I stepped forward to intervene if he decided to get physical again. I was already accustomed to being a punching bag. Tammy just pointed at the gun. I didn't want her around this crap. Tammy was getting angry again. Not to mention your wife finding out. She barely tolerates me as it is. His wife knows about them? I withheld an inappropriate smile. Tony cooled. I could almost see his brain working. He turned his back to us and walked to the couch and sat down. I looked to the gun he had left on the counter. Tammy saw my eyes and shook her head. She wiped her eyes, smearing her makeup some more. She took me by my hand and led me to the sitting area. We sat with the godfather and watched him think. Tony looked up at me. His expression was calm. I have acted rashly, he said, then turned to Tammy. I guess that was my apology. I wasn't going to demand more. Tell me about her. His tone was thoughtful. Tammy smiled. She looked a little ridiculous with smeared blackened cheeks, but I could see Rebecca in the smile. You met her. Rebecca. She was the one staying with me a few weeks ago. She knows? Tony asked. No, Tammy said quickly. And she can never know. She has her own problems, and I don't want her to have ours. She's a pretty girl, Tony said, almost talking to himself. Tammy spent a good part of the morning telling Tony about Rebecca. In the middle of it, Tony went to the bathroom and returned with a washcloth and wiped the makeup off Tammy's face. I found it odd that one moment he points a gun at her, and the next he is gently caring. Tammy seemed very happy with his care. I found out that Kathy was a childhood friend of Tammy's. They cooked up Rebecca's history between them, forged documents and, after a few years, no one questioned it. Tammy had been supporting Kathy while she cared for Rebecca. No wonder Kathy wanted Rebecca to move back in with her. Rebecca was her gold mine. I tried several times to interject my need to find Rebecca, but was stalled by a stern look. There was a process to the conversation, and Tony defined what that was. I sat back, trying to remain comfortable while not moving my torso. By 10, I had a scotch in my hand. Tony had decided alcohol was a good idea, and he didn't drink alone. It was hard going down, but the warmth seemed to dull the pain in my torso especially the sharp one in my side. What do you do? Tony asked. He lifted his half-empty glass and pointed to me. It wasn't small talk. He demanded to know. I'm a database administrator for an insurance company, I replied, not wanting to tell him which insurance company. I really didn't wish to see him or his people ever again. Does it pay well? I was being interviewed. He had only known he was a father for a couple of hours. I won't starve, I answered cryptically. I took another sip of the scotch and let it burn the back of my throat. Tony's expression was difficult to read. I wasn't sure if my answers were angering him. I wasn't sure if I could beat him in a race to the gun if I needed to. Why did you come here this morning? Tony asked. People usually don't ignore my warnings. Rebecca left me and won't answer my calls. She blames herself for your rashness. I was going to use a different term, but thought better of it. I thought Tammy might know where she is. I intend to get her back. Tony nodded and looked at Tammy. Do you know where she is? Tony asked. Kathy told me. Rebecca won't speak to me anymore. I could see her eyes watering again. 
She knew I was involved in what happened. Tammy looked toward me. She loves you and hates herself for what happened. Tony moved quickly to Tammy's side and put his arm around her. Tammy leaned into him and cried. We'll fix this, Tony said. Almost sweetly. I had trouble wrapping my head around a born killer being violent one minute and calm and caring the next. I wanted out of this freak show. I just wanted Rebecca back. Where is she? I interjected. Corey's Steakhouse. Tammy blubbered. Off Wilkerson Road. She's working the day shift. I knew the place. A large restaurant serving family fare. I got up with the desire to leave. Tony stood with me. It wasn't going to be clean exit. He waved me over to the counter where he wrote a phone number on a piece of paper. If shit happens, anything you can't handle, Tony said, handing me the paper. Call this number and tell them who you are. He put his hand on my shoulder like we were old friends. I didn't like it there, but I didn't dare move it off. Find a way to fix things between Tammy and Rebecca. I'll stay out of it, but know that she's my blood. I will not hesitate if I feel she has been wronged. I guess that is what passes for family bonding in the mob. A threat, a demand, and a magic number that solves problems. I stuffed the number into my pocket. Good, Tony said, smiling at my obvious agreement. He held out his hand like some kind of trophy. I shook it strongly, trying not to appear as weak as I felt. He moved to the door and opened it for me. I sensed he didn't do that often. Another form of apology I suspected. Take care of her, Tammy pleaded as I began walking out. I intend to, I told her. Mountains of stress flowed away when the door closed behind me. Not the visit I had intended at all. Corey's steakhouse was huge. It had a pitched green roof that looked almost homey, held up by faux pillars with a big front porch lined with benches for the evening rush. It was more trough than fine dining. Decent food. Serve quickly in an eat-and-get-out fashion. They churn customers as quickly as possible. Not the gourmet atmosphere I envisioned when I thought of Rebecca's cooking. I stepped inside and was welcomed by no fewer than three high school-age greeters. The place was packed and the tables ran deep into the building. A central bar and the many wooden partitions only allowed you to see a handful of tables at a time. How many in your party, sir? A young man fighting an acne problem asked. Actually, I'm looking for a waitress named Rebecca Morrison. I responded politely. There's no visiting during working hours. The boy returned quickly. I smiled, not really concerned with the rules. Are you going to make me walk around looking for her? I asked pleasantly. A mother with a family waiting for a table, off to the side, gave me a dirty look. I smiled at her also. I can get a manager if you wish, the boy said. Obviously practiced with people who wish to bend the rules. A loud crash of dishes echoed from the left side of the restaurant, beyond my viewing range. It went on for a couple of seconds before it settled. There was a smattering of applause followed by a loud, you witch. I didn't hesitate and moved quickly. I knew there could only be one person in the middle of the disaster. These are new pants, an older man yelled, you're going to pay for this. His face was red with anger. There was some kind of burgundy sauce running down the left leg of his khaki pants. His wife was trying desperately to pull him back to his seat. Everyone at the surrounding tables was watching the scene. That is where I found her. Rebecca was on her knees, her back to me. She was trying hard to pull plates and cups back to the tray she had spilled. I could see her shoulders shaking and I knew she was holding back tears. I'm so sorry. She choked out and tried to wipe his pants with a rag. Don't touch me, you incompetent. The man started, then stalled. When he saw me coming fast, I had removed my glasses and my bruised eyes were on his. All the anger from the past week was boiling under my skin. Put your bum down. I said loudly. The man did. He will never know how intelligent that move was. I pulled out my business card. Send me the bill. I said, handing the card to his wife. The man started to open his mouth. It was an accident, leave it at that, I added firmly. He did. Rebecca was shaking, and I could hear her choking back a full cry. She had heard me, but she wasn't turning around. I knelt down next to her and started helping her fill the tray. Our hands met over a cup. The dam burst and the tears flowed. I wrapped her in my arms, ignoring my complaining broken rib and the restaurant at large. Don't ever leave me again. I whispered in her ear, I am less without your touch. She cried. She nodded and she squeezed me until I saw stars. I love you, I added. More tears. I helped her to her feet, straining not to look as weak as I was. A manager arrived, eyes wide at the mess around our feet. He looked at Rebecca's bloodshot eyes and whispered something into the microphone attached to his headset. Rebecca, he said calmly, while looking at me, take this gentleman to the back. I have a team coming to clean this up. 
He moved to the irate man with the burgundy stain and began trying to retain his patronage. I liked the manager, efficient if nothing else. Rebecca lead me back through the kitchen to an employee break room. She had been wiping her eyes along the way. When we arrived, she turned and her lips caressed mine. The soft kiss quickly warmed to a forceful desire. Her hands circled my head and she pulled me closer. She was mine again. That kiss was worth every ounce of pain it caused in my chest. Look what I did to you, Rebecca said when she pulled her face away. There was sadness in her eyes. I hated that sadness. She brushed her hand lightly across my cheek, trying to wipe the bruising away. I know a secret, I said quietly. I want to give it to you, but you must not act rashly with it. You will want to, but you can't. I wiped my thumbs across Rebecca's cheeks, taking the remnants of her tears with them. She looked at me, a mixture of concern and confusion. I'm afraid I will lose you if you find out another way. Tell me, Rebecca said. Her eyes held love, so I did. I told her all of what I found out that morning. I didn't care how Tammy or Tony felt about Rebecca knowing. Secrets could only hurt us now. When I was done, I stared fearfully into her eyes. You will never lose me again, Rebecca said softly, ignoring the knowledge of her parents. The kiss was more passionate, more us. I lingered in it, wanting time to stop. The world made sense again. The manager entered. We separated. He looked at both of us with a half smile. Your shift is covered, the man said to Rebecca. Take the day and decide if this job is right for you. It isn't, I answered for Rebecca. Rebecca looked at me and nodded in agreement. She was a chef, not a waitress. The manager smiled. Saved him the trouble of having to consider firing someone. I hope this doesn't mean you won't enjoy a meal with us once in a while, the manager said, in full sales mode. This guy was underemployed. A problem solver who never loses sight of the goal line. Of course not, Frank, I said, looking at his name tag. I put out my hand and he shook it. It makes sense, Rebecca commented as we drove away from the restaurant. A lot of things make sense now. I had to agree. I'm still not talking to her, she continued. Not after what she caused. Rebecca reached over and stroked my bruised face. I can't believe he thought you were a gigolo. Am I not hot enough? I joked. You could make a good living, Rebecca answered judiciously, a sly smile gracing her face. She turned away to look out the window. I am afraid though she admitted slowly. Of us. Of the future, Rebecca said. Look what's happened to you. It hasn't even been two weeks. I looked toward her, then back to the road. No tears, no sadness, just thoughtfulness. You're assuming the past dictates the future. I philosophized. I say the worst has been done. It will be smooth sailing from here on out. I looked over quickly and saw Rebecca didn't hold to my optimism. I don't regret any of it, I added, then chuckled. I could have skipped the beating but it was a minor cost for knowing you. What if it gets worse? What if it gets better? I dueled. Rebecca smiled. How sore are you? Rebecca asked. I looked over to very provocative smile. There was a sparkle in her eyes that I could feel between my legs. Not that sore. I lied with a vast smile. Good, Rebecca said, her hand moving to my leg. I returned my eyes to the road as her hand climbed up my thigh. I am told makeup sex is pretty good. I decided the speed limit no longer applied to me. I waited at the altar, or what masqueraded as one, in the small Las Vegas chapel. The past few months had been the best of my life. I hadn't been beaten up for a while, so I decided to propose during the lull. I wasn't even half done with the question when Rebecca said yes. I think she feared something might happen before the end of the question. Rebecca was enrolled in a culinary school. She was on a new level of happy, which put me one step higher, somewhere around ecstatic. Rebecca eventually made up with Tammy, but never acknowledged Tammy as her mother. It was Rebecca's secret now, and it would die with me if she wished it. Carl was looking a little worse for wear next to me. He was experiencing stripper detox. As promised, he threw me a bachelor party that involved three strip clubs and ended around four in the morning. It was the first time in my life that random naked women held little interest. Carl made up for my failings. I had a lot of fun watching him fall in love about ten times. You ready? Kathy called from the entryway. Kathy had remained Rebecca's sister. Rebecca preferred it that way. Kathy was the only family she had known and acknowledgement of the truth would ruin that. Kathy did take care of her growing up. Rebecca thought she was more of a sister than some real sisters. Since I had proposed, Kathy gave up her protectiveness and embraced me as a brother. At least we would have someone for the holidays. I nodded to Kathy and straightened up. Kathy signaled the old lady at the piano and, here comes the bride, started. 
I expected to see Rebecca round the corner in the white dress she and Kathy had picked out. It wasn't a full wedding dress, but I was sure it would be beautiful on her. Carl and I were slightly informal ourselves, in black suits, white shirts and blue ties instead of tuxes. It didn't make sense to go the whole nine yards when we were practically eloping. Kathy's eyes went wide, and she flung her hands out in front of her in the direction Rebecca was coming. I heard something breakable hit the ground followed quickly by other, non-breakable, things. Oh, honey, Kathy said sorrowfully, moving quickly off to the side. Out of my vision, I started moving toward the entryway, hoping it wasn't what I knew it was. Rebecca came around the corner, Kathy helping her along. Half her hair was undone, the rest still in the bun she spent so much time creating. The bouquet of flowers was mostly broken, and her white dress had something dark splattered across the front. The piano player stopped and the justice of the piece coughed uncomfortably. Rebecca was on the verge of tears. I didn't know how to undo it. Damon, Carl called. I turned. Carl had a pot of flowers he had grabbed off the altar. He held them out to me. His silly smile was all the instruction I needed. I undid the button on my suit jacket, pulled the pink carnations out of the pot and dumped the contents, a greenish fertilized water mixture, down the front of my white shirt. I handed the pot back to Carl and marched the flowers to Rebecca. Sorry, I said softly. I had an accident back there. I took the broken bouquet out of Rebecca's hands and replaced it with the carnations whose stems were entirely too long. A tear formed in her eye that belied the smile on her lips. I love you, you know, Rebecca said. I tossed the ruined flowers onto the floor and cocked out my elbow. She put her arm through it, and I nodded to the lady at the piano. The music started again, and I walked my bride to the justice of the piece, who had finally seen everything. Rebecca was shaking when the fifth meter registered the same as the others. Panic coursed through her as she looked at them arrayed along the counter. They all agreed. A six seemed insane, but she thought she should run to the store again anyway. Rebecca heard the garage door going up, and she bit her lower lip. Damon was home early. She quickly swept the meters into the kitchen drawer. She opened the refrigerator and pulled out the balsamic marinated chicken she had prepared for dinner. If she looked busy, maybe he wouldn't know something was wrong. She had no way of knowing how he would react. She didn't want to lose him over this. Got off early, Damon said happily, hanging his jacket in the closet. That's nice, Rebecca stuttered, realized it, and added, I'm glad you're home. Damon sensed Rebecca was harried. He let it go. What's for dinner? Chicken, Rebecca answered and started transferring the chicken breasts to a cooking tray. What's wrong? Damon asked, suspicious of her one-word answer. What do you mean? Rebecca replied as she set the oven temperature. You never make just chicken, love, Damon continued. It always has a name I need explained to me. He moved closer and wrapped his arms around Rebecca from the back. She leaned back and pecked his cheek, then returned to moving the tray of chicken to the oven. Damon released her a little surprised, wondering where his welcome home lips were. Did I do something wrong? Damon asked, taking a step back. Rebecca caught the edge of the pan on the side of the oven lost her grip and it all tumbled to the floor. Frustration forced her hand. She turned to Damon with tears she couldn't hold back. There's been another accident, Rebecca sobbed and fell into Damon's arms. He knew she didn't mean the chicken. Tell me, Damon whispered. He held her as she found the courage. You promise not to be angry? Rebecca pleaded. Damon promised, so she slowly pulled open the drawer. It took a moment before Damon figured out what he was looking at. He lifted up one of the digital meters. It was clearly displaying the word, pregnant. He pulled out another with the same results. He smiled, knowing the others would be the same. You will make a wonderful mother, Damon said, pulling Rebecca back into his arms. You're not upset? Rebecca asked. Damon answered with his lips. A long welcome home, welcome parenthood, welcome to life kiss. Rebecca melted into him. It was only an accident, after all. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like share and subscribe.